The following program is rated TBMA for language and sexual situations. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of The Chris David Show, he's like, I'm Joey, Joey Black, have a drink. And his friends were trying to get me to drink moonshine. I have that conversation and said, because now you're in a situation, right? This is what you like, but what are her likes? I didn't know that a kitty could be ugly. I know how to talk to people. I know how to interact with people, connect with people. Y'all thought that Timberwolves game was wild? Wait till I tell you what went on at Walmart this morning. Disrespectful. Like, full stop. Disrespectful. Heads think I'm just going to remain the same person I was in high school and be stuck with them in their 15-year-old mentality. Only toxic people weaponize things that people can't change. You ever saw an Instagram model? You don't actually know how to talk. What am I supposed to rap about? Like, I have to go get a colonoscopy or something like that? For somebody, for me to tell them, hey, I'm having a bad day. Not a lot of people have that. Tell her to sell some of those handbags she's got. She's got over a thousand handbags. This is what's going on in AI porn. Look, 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 look at her head. We look good as hell in 4K. Welcome back to The Chris David Show. I'm your host, Chris David. Here to join us for a brand new Chris David Show Guy Talk Men's Discussion Panel. We have my guys, Joey the Heckler Bastin, AKA Joey Black, and Kai, Black Kinda the Chunky Jaden Smith Thomas. Clap it up and give my guys a warm Chris David Show welcome. We back. <laughs> Now, now listen, I know it's Black Friday and we all have turkey hangovers and all, and I saw some wild shit this morning while I was out in these Black Friday streets. I'll get to that later, but listen, let's, let's just jump right in. If you're within the sound of my voice, you know that the Black Friday sales kicked off weeks ago. As a matter of fact, the holiday shopping season seems like it gets earlier and earlier. I kid you not, I saw Christmas ads back in August. According to a holiday shopping trend report from Adobe, the discounts being offered this year will reach record highs. And even though there are plenty of great sales today, the best prices will still come around Cyber Week. Today is the best day to get a TV at a new discount. Tomorrow is expected to bring the deepest discounts on laptops. Toys and apparel will be at their best prices on Sunday. And Cyber Monday will be the ideal time to purchase electronics and appliances. Now, the good people over at Consumer Reports have some Black Friday shopping tips to help us all find the best offers. Tip number one, start early. Now you should have started shopping back in October, but I won't go too far in on that ass. Sales have been going on for weeks now and retailers are offering deals on items in virtually every category of human consumption. Many retailers have holiday refund and return policies that include partial refunds for items that go on sale for less later in the season. For example, Target offers price match adjustments for anything bought in the store or online between October 22nd and Christmas Eve. If you see that the price has dropped, contact customer service and they'll refund you the difference. Make sure you have your receipts. Look at Target trying to redeem themselves. I'll see you, player. Number two, shop online. While many deals are available in store, you may have more luck and more options by shopping on your phone or computer. In recent years, retailers have offered more of the same promotions online as they do in stores. A lot of stores were closed yesterday, so this may be the thing to do if you're really trying to pick up something for the holidays. Tip number three, use websites and apps. In order to judge how good the deals really are in crunch time, you need to track prices. The good thing is you don't have to go retailer by retailer to compare prices. The Consumer Reports website lists the current prices at various outlets for all the products in their ratings. You can also try Google Shopping, Price Grabber, and Shopzilla. When you're in a store, smartphone apps such as Buy Via, Shopkick, Shop Savvy, and Shopula let you scan barcodes or QR codes to compare prices and get discounts and coupons. Listen, baby, let me get what's on a coupon. Also, Look into browser extensions like Camel Camel Camel, Keeper, and Honey, which will show you price histories, price alerts, and available coupons when you shop online. Tip number four, 
Use loyalty programs. Store loyalty programs often grant members early access to coupon sales and promotions, then let them earn rewards on what they buy. Tip number five, get social. The Facebook and Instagram feeds of your favorite retailers are a great way to find out about exclusive deals and promotions. Retailers will often reward customers who like or follow them with special alerts to discounts and incentives. Text and social media posts are also an easy way to share Black Friday shopping intel with friends and family. Tip six, create a budget and stick to it. Black Friday sales are designed to get you shopping and buying things that you weren't intending to buy. Since it's easy to get caught up in overspend, plan ahead of time of how much you want to spend and do your best to resist impulse buying, especially if you're not sure how good a deal is. I know that if you use your credit card to shop, a lot of them will double the manufacturer's warranty. You just got to watch out for those interest-free promotions. I mean, they're not so bad if you're disciplined enough to pay off the balance before the promotional period is over. But if you aren't, you're going to be stuck paying the full interest on the full amount of the purchase. Tip number seven, check all store policies in advance. It's always good to know a store's price match and return policies. Mostly all major retailers have some form of price match policy. However, some stores may suspend their price match guarantees on certain items this weekend. So do your researches and read the fine print. Check the store's return and exchange policies to make sure that they won't charge you a restocking fee. Now, these last three tips apply strictly to TVs. Today, Black Friday, is the day you will see the biggest discounts on televisions. I saw TVs this morning with discounts as high as 35, 40%. So if you're looking to upgrade your TV, do it. I mean, we look good as hell in 4K. Some stores are selling low-priced TVs made specifically for Black Friday called derivatives, as they're derived from mainstream models and have scaled back features such as fewer HDMI inputs or a simpler remote control. Consumer Reports says they perform just as good even though they run $100 to $150 cheaper. We won't say names, but we all know what those models are. Maybe you don't want one for your living room, but perhaps you have a son or daughter who's going off to school next summer, or you have you know, a guest room or an office, or if you cook a lot like me, you might want a small, simple flat screen to put in your kitchen. Check out a derivative or knockoff, <laughs> as we say, where I'm from, model. Speaking of cheap, beware the cheapest set. Doorbusters draw people in with visions of savings, but the TVs are not always worth the price. Keep in mind that you're going to be watching football games, Christmas movies, the Chris David show, the Super Bowl, and a whole lot of programming on your new TV for years and years. If you're not happy with the features or the picture quality, you're, not, you're going to regret not spending that extra $50 to $100 to get what you really wanted. Also, retailers have more wiggle room on a step-up or flagship model, so don't hesitate to ask for a better price regardless of the time of the year. I did consumer reports they like because they really just want us to do well out here in these mean retail streets. We have some shipping deadlines here as well. Keep in mind, earlier is better because you never know how long a retail it takes to ship, especially this time of year, especially with small businesses and independent sellers like on eBay and Etsy. Always check their FAQ or shipping and return sections to get accurate shipping information. But now if you're one of those last minute spirits, don't worry, we got you. In order to send gifts via USPS, you'll need to ship by Saturday, December 16th for ground advantage, Monday, December 18th for priority, or Wednesday, December 20th for priority mail express. All of that information is up at USPS.com. With UPS, you must ship by Tuesday, December 19th for three days select, Wednesday, December 20th for second day air, or Thursday, December 21st with Saturday delivery options. For next day air, Thursday, December 21st is your shipping day, or Friday, December 22nd with Saturday delivery options. For ground and ground saver, UPS has a website where you can enter the addresses you'll be shipping to and from for detailed shipping estimates. That site is ups.com slash CTC. C for calculate, T for time, and C for cost.
if you're shipping with FedEx, your ground economy deadline is early this year, Wednesday, December 13th, for FedEx Express Saver, Tuesday, December 19th, FedEx 2-day and 2-day AM, Wednesday, December 20th, and for FedEx same day, that day is Friday, December 22nd. For FedEx ground and FedEx home delivery deadlines, visit FedEx.com. <laughs> Get those gifts shipped out now. Matter of fact, as soon as you're done watching us, place your orders so that they get there on time because 30 days comes at you fast. A month really doesn't feel like a month anymore. But Kai, I mean, what do you think? Good tips, right? I mean, they're great tips. I think one thing is always have a strategy, right? What am I buying? How do I buy it? What do I want? And understanding quality over quantity, right? I think a lot of times we get into this name brand thing, right? We look at things as electronics, but real talk, they're all the same parts, all the same chips. It's really a matter of if it's something for a long-term purchase or if it's something for tomorrow. So I think the biggest thing with any of this is, what is my game plan? Well, how can I go about it? And can I save them much as possible? <laughs> there you go. Joey Black, what about you? I think preparation is the most important thing. Um, if you're prepared, like you said, like make sure things go out the 17th or before, like I'm a last minute person. So me waiting the week of Christmas to go get all the presents is not smart because you go to the UGG store, they don't have anything you need. You go to wherever you, you just gotta, now you're at the mercy of everybody else and all of the traffic. So being prepared and doing those type of things, like that's always gonna help you out and you won't have to worry. Like my my uh my sister in law, she she gets her done. She she's already done. Like our presents are under the tree already. I don't have to worry about my presents with her. So he has to worry about it. That's how you her. do it. I don't know, Joey. She need to rub off on you a little bit because that's how you do it. Like I'm done. I've too been early. done since like September. So <laughs> yeah, no, she was done since like May. <laughs> that's too early. That is that man. That is kind of early. Wow. That's that's like super early. But yeah, listen, she gets it done. We're informative here at the Chris David Show. I am an Afrofuturistic magical Negro version of Joan Hamburg. And if you don't know who she is, ask your grandparents. But uh, those tips were uh, courtesy of uh, Consumer Reports. Good morning. Hi. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, Thomas, the one and only, um, your favorite person's favorite person. I'll say that much. Um, man of many trades, master of all. Uh, really just how you're living the best of life. That's all I can really say. Taking it one day. It won't turn up at the time. <laughs> Listen. All right, so let me tell you guys. Me and the Kai hung out. This was at Industry City in Brooklyn, in Sunset Park. Look, I, look, I know we look related. We're not related, I promise. But, um, <laughs> yo, but listen, listen. Kai's friends, right? Kai brought his friends with him. And his friends were trying to get me to drink moonshine. <laughs> so, so listen, listen. He had his homie RK. RK is like this short, like, like mob deep looking dude. And then, then he had these two Spanish guys with him and they were like trying to give me bottles and shit. And I'm like, yo, man, I don't know what it is with you people trying to give me liquor when I'm out. <laughs> anyway, Kai, you be in these streets hard body. I can't hang out like I used to, but it was good seeing you. And then we, I saw you upstate too. I mean, you pulled up for like two minutes and then hey, you bounced. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm only trying to be there for the photo, right? It's proof I was here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. <laughs> I feel you. How, by the way, Kai, how's your mom doing? How's your mom? I'm doing really well, really, really well. You know, we're focused on that state of life. I think with parents, it's always assumed that they have it, but how do you help them navigate towards what retirement looks like? You've been working for 40 plus years. What's the next stage? So, parents are stubborn, but that's what we're working towards. Like, hey, mom. It's time to just relax. Let's go to the spa, get you in your bridge club, all the good stuff. But, you know, I still got to hit me. I'm like, I know you do, but real talk, let's just sit down. Let's relax. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, we had the Chris David Show send our love to Aunt Bootsy, Kai's mom, and the entire Thomas family. And um, Joey, go ahead and introduce yourself to the good people. Um, I'm Joey, Joey Black, Joey Crew, Joey Chronicles. Um. Just your uh, everyday average guy, you know, here to here to turn up, have fun, you know, crack a joke, you know what I mean, make you smile, and then maybe a little bit of heckler because everybody likes a little bit of a little bit of mean comedy because it's true most of the time, just a little bit. All right, now listen, we got to get to how Joey got the name Joey the Heckler. 
Okay, so back in April, I went to this comedy show out in Philly called Joke Sisters. If you follow me on IG, and I don't know why you would since you're watching, listening. I have some posts up from that show, which was created by uh, Chris David Show alumni, one funny sister, Ms. Joanna Briley. Shout out to Joanna, by the way, too. Happy belated to um, So this guy over here, all right, he comes in and he's with his mom, he's with his girl, uh, Brittany, he's with his sister, Victoria, and her dude. Good looking group of people. So Joey and Victoria, they bounce and they come back like 20 minutes later with these brown bags. So Joanne is still up there doing crowd work and she doesn't miss a beat. And she, they, they walk back in and she's like, what's this? Thing? And so Joey goes, it's 800. And she's like, it's tequila. It's keto. My family crest is a tequila bottle. So then they get cups. And they're mixing it with some strawberry shit and everybody is drinking thanks to Joey and Victoria. So, so let's clap it up for that. So wait, but then, so the comics go up and they're doing their bits and everything and Joey's doing Q&A with each and every one of them. And yo, and yo, and then he's getting more and more tipsy and doing more and more Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I'm a few rows back and I'm like, yo, who is this cat? And Kai, he wasn't rude or anything. Like he wasn't nasty with it, but I'm just like, son, chill. So at the end, um, Joanna shouts me out and everything. And after the show, I'm in the back, you know, I'm socializing and, you know, doing what I do. So this dude right over here, not, not Kai, but this dude right over here, he comes up to me and he's like, yo, I want to be on your show. And I'm like, well, oh, are you comedian or something? Like, you know, because he reminds me of Jimmy Martinez, if you guys know who Jimmy Moore is. But anyway, I'm like, what do you do? And he's like, I'm Joey, Joey Black, have a drink. <laughs> So I'm looking at his sister, I'm like, are you responsible for him? And she's cracking up and he's like, come on, man, let me make you a drink. So I'm like, dude, I can't be driving with alcohol in a red cup. Like I might as well just turn my headlights off and, and not wear my seatbelt for all that. Just go straight James Bond with it, you know? So, so, you know me, all right? You know I'm resourceful. And I use everything. I'm the hoods MacGyver. So I spot these to-go cups, you know, the kind for coffee, and then with the lid over on the counter. So I grab the cup and I go, okay, put it in this just a little bit. He's like, oh, man, come on, you got to have some with me now. And he's pouring that shit like crazy. And I'm like, I got to drive, nigga. And so I take a sip and I'm like, damn, this is nice. And so he fills up my 12-ounce to-go cup with 1,800 uh, strawberry tres agaves, yo, yo Kai. We turned it into Wawa with alcohol. Mm -hmm. and, and this was when I knew that he was that dude. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and Joey, I have to thank you because you actually gave me the idea for the Chris David show men's discussion panel. Guy taught men's discussion panel. Because oh, wow. I said, how else are we going to have him on? So, yeah, one drink started all of this. So, um, and Joey was actually supposed to be with us on our very first men's panel but he was under the weather. So um, shout out to Joey's mom, Joey's sister, shout out to Brittany, the whole Bastin fan. And anyway, speaking of drinks, what's the drink, the official drink for this episode of the Chris David Show men's discussion panel? So what is this right here? What is this called? It's Let's Epsilon. Epsilon. And where can we find Epsilon at? Where can we find um, at your, uh, if you're in the Philly area, at your local fine wine and spirits. And if you're in Brooklyn, where Kai is, just go to the corner store, the bodega. They're selling liquor. Or go to your local moonshine man. Go ahead, pause the show, make that drink, and we'll wait for you. Just don't wash it down with tater tots. It's a little <laughs> inside joke. All mm -hmm. right, so guys, I have this letter that one of our viewers sent in for our sex coach, uh, Mrs. Tony Dramite Antoine. So get your questions in ASAP. But this is our men's panel. So we wanted to give our perspective on this. So here's the letter. It says, anonymous, uh, this comes from anonymous. Anonymous writes, I've been dating this guy I met off of a dating app for seven months now. When I ask him what he thinks about us, he really doesn't give me any clear answers. I ask my girlfriends what they think is going on with him, and they tell me he probably isn't big on relationships. I like him and I want to be his girl. How long does it take for a man to know 
if he really wants to be with you? First and foremost, I think it's clear communication, right? A lot of this is just vibes and feelings. At least you heard, like, oh, I asked a question. I didn't like the answer I got back. So I don't know how to feel about it versus what's direct and clear. But I think we understand is what is the dynamic of a relationship? What are we looking for, right? How are we defining it? Do we go into it of we're kicking it, we're having a good time trying to find one another, or we're dating with intention? And I think more so the fact of we need to see people through seasons. And sometimes seven months is maybe not the right time. Because have I seen you at your best? Have I seen you at your worst? Have we gone through a little, you know, scuffle between each other? Or has it always been a honeymoon phase? So seven months, it is a time. But at the same time, if it's summer and fall, what does winter look like? No birthdays, no holidays. I don't know where you run these big milestones. So honestly, it's a few things to take away from that is first, clear communication. You know, even the question of, well, what do you mean by that, right? I think even the question we got people where you say, hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. Are you really good? Oh, snap. So ask me a follow-up question. Maybe they sent something. Really do that because I think the more you're questioning, wondering, you're going to keep spinning versus just ask the question and be prepared to have uncomfortable conversations because you'd rather have that versus what you're going through right now, submitting in on this question to get answers. Hmm. Joey, you've been with your girlfriend, the yeah, lovely it, Brittany, for five yeah. years. Speak some wisdom into this young woman's life. So uh, it's really, so I, I haven't been dating in a very long time. So the dating scene is a lot different than it was five years ago. So I know that um, like, People are very intentional or they should be more intentional. And sometimes like you don't like like you were saying, like you might just need to ask a question. But also it's hard because because you're on Tinder and you're on all these other like like with social media and everything like that, you're you're able to access a lot more people a lot faster. So I was next to a couple the other day at a restaurant and they're on the first date and she was like, what are your flaws? What are your this? What are your that? And he's probably like, whoa, like, that's a, you're, you're speeding right now. Like, we just enjoyed the first date. Them being seven months in, he's probably like, all right, maybe I'm still trying to figure this out. She seems, or the anonymous person seems like they're ready for the relationship. So that timing might be different. Like, the, like I don't I don't know how everybody's timing is, but that is something that should definitely be addressed because some people some people as soon as they're dating they're dating for a reason and I want to be in a relationship and it doesn't take me five months to know that I like somebody it only takes me X Y Z amount of time but some other people is like no I got to get to know you I got to get to learn you maybe just the dating part of it is for me to vet you properly so that when I do ask you to be my significant other or anything like that, then that's that's how it'll progress. But then also some people just wanna have fun. And if I say I wanna just have fun with you, you might not take me seriously anymore because you're like, no, I'm not here just to have fun with you. I'm here for, for, a, real, like for a real reason. So I think it can get very dicey, but I think it is still very, like very important that you guys do have those conversations to find out at what stage because I've seen it before like friends of mine they are they're like talking to somebody for years and they never became official but was that because of a lack of communication or was that because there was no standard set early on that you you might be able to get the my mom calls it the boyfriend light you get all the boyfriend or all the girlfriend uh uh, benefits without actually having a boyfriend, girlfriend title or responsibility. So I don't know. And, you know, I think that couple who you were talking, talking about, you overheard them at the next table. I love that you're out ear hustling, by the way. But um, <laughs> I think that's something they should have talked about before they even went out on the date. Like, that's something that initially they should have, you know, hammered out, you know, intentions and expectations, like way before going out to dinner. Because I just know me personally, I'm not going anywhere with anyone till we've had those discussions. I think it's, it's interesting, right? Because where I am in my season, apps mean something different, right? Apps are an interview. We already established we like each other. 
and now these are equality versus if I met you out at the restaurant at the bar, I want to have asked you about your flaws. I'm still trying to get to know you on the natural tip. So we're going to do that on the first date. And so we're doing it for the app. It's already almost like we're getting some of the basic things away versus the natural going of, if I best put it on the bar, I'm not asking her, hey, you want a drink? And what's your time your season? That's not going to happen that way. And so that's why I look at it in a sense of how are we going about it? Because the way we engage this dictates how we go about it in the future. That's just, again, that's my thoughts because apps mean I'm looking for someone, I'm seeking a specific thing. I found it. We're going intentional versus I saw you on Tuesday. We text a little bit. Hey, let's get coffee. I met you not in that setting, in that mindset of, hey, you caught my eye. I'm not asking for your top three flaws. So I look at it as the intention of how we did we engage. Was it naturally saw you, good moment, rom-com? Or here's the interview, you pass the test, you check the boxes, now we're going out. I look at it that way. That's just me. Got you. <laughs> No, 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 no. I totally get it. I totally, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I mean, because yeah, uh, if you're meeting somebody out at a bar, you're not going to be like, yeah, so what's your five-year plan? <laughs> yeah, but also that's what they're doing on dating sites. Like, you're you're literally, like, it is an interview. Like, I'd probably be, if I'm back in the streets, if they threw me back, if Brittany ever threw me back in the water, then I would, they would probably do that to me. Like, are you, they're going to probably, like, there's certain expectations, like, First of all, you have to meet whatever those expectations are. Hopefully they like hopefully they're clear cut enough that or you naturally do them so that you don't automatically get ghosted or red flag them already by saying, hey, let's go to get coffee. Well, why don't you take me on a real date? Like, because I don't know you yet. You know what I mean? So you have stuff like that. And then when I do that, they also, like I said, no one wants their time wasted. I don't want to waste my time with this other person. They don't want to waste their time with me. So they're trying to probably get all let's get all of the let's get all of the let's get all the paperwork done now so that we can just enjoy each other's company for the remaining of the time. I'm curious though. How'd you and Brittany meet? So it, it's funny. So I I like chicken wings. Everybody likes chicken wings. Sunday, Sunday pizza, chicken wing favorite right here. So um I've done that with my brother and sister. We uh we had a sibling day, you know, like we do corny stuff like that. We had sibling day. We went to um, New York had one. It's called the Long Island Chicken Wing Festival. So that was over the summertime. And then about five years ago, uh, Philadelphia has their own version of that same type of festival where you have different vendors. They make chicken wings and then you kind of go there. They have beer vendors. So you have you get beer and chicken wings together. Right. Match made in heaven. So we go. I'm with my sister this time. My brother couldn't make it. So I'm with her and her husband. And we're just going, some some people, they have great chicken wings. Some people, they're kind of bland and gray and scary looking, but still a good time. So my brother-in-law, he was, um, his friend was dating this girl. This girl happened to be Brittany's sister, her twin sister. And um, they end up coming to the chicken wing festival with, with him. So they all met up. So we meet, I meet him. He's a cool guy. Um, and then he brought these two other young ladies with him. So we're like, all right, cool. I didn't pay her any mind because I didn't know her. So then we all decided after, after like, we're a little bit buzzed. We go get, um, after we ate, we end up going to go bowling just to, like, keep the keep the party going. So we go bowling. And then at this point, everybody's coupled up but me and her. Like, everybody has their significant other or who they're talking to. So I'm alone. She's alone. And... She also had a very like uh, uninterested face. She looked like she wanted to get out of there. Like she was not having a good time. So of course me being the uh, sly fox that I am, I'm like, hey, why are you so mad looking? You know, like just chopping it up. So she kind of put a smile on her face. So then I'm like, okay, cool. So since we're bowling, bowling is a competitive sport. I'm competitive. So I said, hey, let's do this. If I win this first game of bowling against you, cause everybody else is coupled up, I win against you. You buy a drink. If you win, I buy the drink. So I win the first game, naturally. So that's great. So she buys the drink. We have the first round. We're still talking. We're enjoying each other's company. Now it's the second game. So I had to up the stakes a little bit. I said, uh, how about this? If I win, you give me your number. If I lose, you don't have to give me your number. Long story short, and this is the best part of the story, I lose that game. That game is totally lost to me. I lose 105 to like 100. She definitely beats me. So I look at her. 
I didn't give her puppy dog eyes, but I gave her a look like, so what are we doing now? And then she gave me a smile and said, I'm still going to give you your number. And I said, of course you are. You have to. That's a, as part of the, as part of the, uh, the, the mating ritual dance. So I gave her the dance and uh, she gave me her number. And then we watched football and now we're five years. Everything's history. Nice. You look like a 2000s, you know, UPN sitcom couple. So, I mean, you know, it, it was meant to be anonymous. I'm going to keep it real with you. He doesn't like you. We're men. We're not that complex. If he liked you, he would have shown you immediately. I mean, you, you heard Joey's story. I mean, a man who likes you shows up and you don't have to pine for confirmation. You'll know. Make sure, And he'll make sure you do. And you're 30. You should know better. And you two are obviously having sex because you sent this in for our sex coach. Anyway, if he's around, ask your father what he thinks of this guy. If you don't have your father, ask your grandfather or another man in your family who's been married or in a long-term relationship. Best. Um, we get some really interesting letters in for, the, for, the, for Coach Tony. Um, we get some wild cards, too, because one was like, I think my husband's gay. Please advise. Like, just so deadpan. Like, no details. Just please advise. And even Coach Tony was like, you got to give us more details as to why you think your husband's gay. But that went well. You guys want to do another one? We got another one here. Run it. Let's right, go for it. Cool. So this one's from a guy named Steve. Steve's 40. He's from Brooklyn. Shout out to Brooklyn. Yes. Steve yeah. writes, I'm trying to get my new lady into a fetish that I have for doing it out in the open. I like fooling around in the park, on the bus, and the train in Ubers and taxis and even at the movies. I like my lady a lot, but I don't know how she's going to take it. See, me and my last chick used to get it in all over the place, up in the dressing room at Macy's. I sure <laughs> hope, I hope to God it wasn't Fulton Street. <laughs> in the restaurant booth, just anywhere we got the urge. I need some tips on getting my new lady to be more of a freak body, as you say. Please help. Peace, Steve. Now, Kai. Steve sounds like one of your homeboys, so I'm gonna let you take this first. Well, honestly, I with all this, right? It's talking, it's communication. But the thing is, it's a matter of comfortability, right? So how far are you to this? Am I introducing this? And I think the reason why people have the you know compatibility in the bedroom, intimacy or things, we're not talking, we're going about what we've been trained. A lot of men are doing what they've been doing since 16. They're not learning new tricks, they're not doing whatever else. And my old partner, my guy, this isn't your old partner, this is someone new. So have that conversation or saying, because now you're in a situation, right? This is what you like, but what are her likes? How do you find compromise? Because it seems very like, this is what me, me, me want versus her. And she's uncomfortable. How do you ease her into that? What are the tips to say, hey, we don't have a full blown back to the Macy's, but hey, maybe try something in a car in a public spot in the park. Then we ease into something more, a little bit more public. But how do you get someone who's never done that, especially when you are over older age, you're setting your ways. This is new. You is scary for a lot of folks. And that doesn't bring does that bring discomfort. Because now it's now becoming a oh, the reason why you can't enjoy our time together is because of how you're not able to do what my old girl did. That might bring insecurity to her. Cause maybe she wants to be there for you, but she can't. But in all honesty, see it's either a, having a conversation so they know exactly in the bedroom, hey, I enjoy what we do, but I want to take it another step. And then ease, right? No one's going into something where it's like, hey, new king, new fetish, day one, let's go. You got to grow into it, the comfortability. So I would just say conversation, communication, but also show her what it actually means. Because I can tell you I want to do something in the park. What does that really mean? Is it full on, you know, ramp sex? Is it, you know, maybe some little hands play, foreplay? There's different levels of things. So I think is having that clarity of what are my needs and how can you help me meet my needs and how can we do it together? Joey, any advice for Steve? Yeah, first of all, you just got to know, like, everybody's different. Some people have a higher sex drive. Some people have a lower sex drive. Some people like to be more spontaneous. Some people like it more structured. I like, some people like vanilla sex. Everybody's different. It's okay. What it comes down to is, like he's saying, communication, but also once you have those conversations, you got to understand that that is not your ex, that, that she might not be the freak that you want her to be. And that might be OK. Or if it's not OK, then you got to 
you got to see where there is compromise or if there is no compromise, then maybe that might not be the best fit. Just because if you if you need that, then you might be lacking that because she might be like like some people are very like very adamant about not doing things like that. Like some people are older, like he's in his 40s. Right. If you're in your 40s. That might be something that an older woman might be like, that's a young girl thing. I'm not young like that anymore to just do it in the car anymore. Like, we don't do it in the backseat. Yes, as a me, I'm at, at 35. I'm like, yeah, like, let's do it in the backseat. Why not? Like, I haven't done that. You know what I mean? I haven't done, uh, I haven't illegally drank in a long time either. So let's do stupid stuff like that as a joke. But that's really like, some people are like, no, like, sexual intercourse is made for the home or made for something a little bit more private. And unless you gauge it, unless, unless she gives you that type of that, unless she gives you that type of mentality that she's with doing stuff like that, then you have to find out some way. So either you could try to introduce it like little by little and see how far, how far that can go. Or you basically have a full blown conversation and see what her hard lines are like going forward like would you be into this some people are into swinger clubs some people are not into swinger clubs so having those conversations to see or you can at least gauge it to see where you are and where you fall in um don't i would i would think if they're not really into that you would do it like incrementally and see how like see if they'll at least get to a place where it's kind of a middle ground but it gets like I said. I, I know I know a lot of older women that are like I probably wouldn't do that just because they think that is something more of a more of a it's an image like an immaturity type of thing. So, okay, Steve, I'm gonna hit you like Coach Tony would say, and say communication is key. Let your lady know that you have this fetish and that you like to explore this with her. Now, I'm all for sexual exploration, exhibitionism, voyeurism, etc. But be smart out in those streets, Steve, mm -hmm. because you don't want to fuck around and wind up on the registry. But you know what? You know what, Steve? Make being an assertive communicator your New Year's resolution. Do you guys make New Year's resolutions? I don't because the thing is, any goal, will I achieve it or do I set myself for failure, right? Because then there's that anxiety of, oh, it's, on the, it's, it's something I need to do, but if I don't do it, how do I feel about myself? Honestly, I think anything with a new year, it's more of a perspective. Like, oh, I'm going to have a fresh mindset. Maybe there's something that I want to think about differently or how I approach things. But honestly, a goal, goals are sometimes tough to achieve. What's realistic? So honestly, I don't have new year, like goals or resolutions. It's more so let's reflect and see what we can do better. It's like one of those things like new year, new me type of thing. And it's like... It if you want to make any active changes, you don't need a you don't need a set time to make those active changes. If you don't if you don't want to drink anymore, just stop drinking. If you don't want you don't have to you don't have to wait like, well, no, like I want to stop drinking, but you know, Thanksgiving is coming and then I have Christmas and then then after that, then after Christmas and then New Year's and then after that, then I'm gonna stop drinking and then I'll I'll cut it, I'll cut it down and I won't smoke as much and I won't do like if you want to make those changes, you can make them at any point. If you don't feel like you're ready to stop drinking, then don't stop drinking. If you don't think your drink is a problem, then it might it might be a problem. But it, until you see it as a problem, then it's not a problem. So those type of things, like those changes that you want to see or you want to make, you can make them at any point. So if if you if you like to do it as like maybe a ritual type of thing, well, every every year I do I try to do something different, and I can see how that could be somewhat beneficial, but. If you really are trying to make resolutions and changes, you can do that at any point. You don't have to wait till the new year to do that. You know, it's hard enough just coping with the nonsense during the holidays. And I'm just like, why should I punish myself trying to stick to something that I could start at any time? I mean, if I were to start a resolution, I would start in, in November. I mean, it's a head start. And plus, my birthday's in January, like literally the first week of January. I'm too busy indulging to start a regiment. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you guys cope through the holidays so i'm pretty chill like i i found that it, people get stressed out about stuff because they just they 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 take too much of it in like they internalize too much of it like i if you can't buy the best gifts for your significant other or for your families and things like that get on what you can and it's okay like you you're beating yourself up like i know that my kid wanted the new the new iPhone or something like that. Like if you can't get them the new iPhone and you can get them something that's still like 
that's still something from the heart and it's still meaningful and it's still it's something that they can utilize and use and things like that then that's still fine like you don't have to it doesn't have to be anything more than that and also you don't have to beat yourself up if you can't deliver like at the end of the day like the reason why we get disappointed is because we get disappointed in ourselves we don't it's not because we it, it it's because you feel like I should be able to to do these type of things. I should be able to afford the new phone to give to my kid because they deserve that. And I want to be able to give that to them. And that's very noble and everything like that. But if you just don't have the means, you don't have the means. And that's okay too. I, I feel like there's feel like there's too much pressure. I, I don't feel that pressure because I just never cared enough to to feel that pressure. Like if I can do it, then great. And if I can't do it, then that's okay also like it, it, it's gonna have to be that way because um I work on machinery all day I can get mad at a machine all I want to but what I learned is that the machine never gets mad because it's a machine and then the only person that is mad is me <laughs> and the only and the only person that it hurts is me so why well, hurt myself like I don't have her feelings anymore I can't get mad at things like I can't get mad at a TV for being broken it's a TV can't get mad back at um, but what about you, Kai? How do you cope through the holidays? Yeah, I mean, I think we're in a culture of capitals, right? It's all about what's all my dollars spend it. And I see time and time again, friends, others, people going to debt for the season, right? Like, we create this culture of you work 12 months to get rewarded now. How do you change that culture and maybe reward throughout the year? But in true honesty, Whatever you got to do, be okay with it, right? I think one of the things we talk about is like, you know, how'd you get it? Oh, I did it. Like, be okay with being on that way. Be okay going forward. I mean, we have Clark, I mean, all these different things out here. It's okay to pay in pieces, but honestly, you got to make sure that whatever you're doing for it, you're doing it what satisfies you, right? If my love language is gifts, that's how I receive the love. And everyone doesn't receive it the same way. But in all this season, I think it's truly a matter of will I get the right of the pleasure I want from doing this action? But at the same time, it's tough because everyone has family. I think it's a variety of your communities. That's why you see a lot of friends giving and white elephants because not everyone can go to a home. Everyone has that in themselves. So honestly, do what's best to surround yourself with that one so you want to feel love and joy because I think we might, there's some of us who are like, oh, I got to go to my mom's house, I got to do this, ah, uh ah. -uh. There's some people who parents pass away don't have the luxury anymore. And honestly, it's a season of we got to get back to what it actually means, right? Even for myself, day of, I'm sending out my mass text of happy holidays to all my homies because they may not be getting that for no one else. And at least they're getting from me to know that I care about you. And yeah, we don't have to change gifts, but you know the love is there. I don't know if you get a flight home to if you live in Tennessee is going to be expensive. But I was able to have a moment because – when my friends tell me, yeah, I'm home in my apartment by myself. I don't have a meal. You're going to the Asian takeout take versus the last week we, we broke bread together. So honestly, how did I do the work to say, I'm okay with whatever I, however I move. And that's what I need. And I think in society, we're told we should be doing something else. We should be acting like this. Because in order to be accepted, that's what's needed. But it's okay to march your own drum. Be your own little drummer boy. Do what you want to do. And those that love you and respect you, they'll be like, you know what? I got you. And I think we're getting away with what community means versus what community represents. Hmm. Absolutely. And you know what? Um, I think that's more meaningful. And, you know, you mentioned that white elephant thing. I, can, I can't get down with that. I heard about that, like what that is. And I was just like, you're not taking my gift from me. But, um, <laughs> but here's the thing. But with me. I've learned to minimize contact because I know that the, the holidays can be stressful for some people. And if you can't contact me, then you can't agitate me. Simple. <laughs> Protect Set your peace. Protect your peace. I mean, <laughs> if you want to see me so bad, watch the Chris David show. Otherwise, you don't get a subscription to Chris Plus. But anyway, because <laughs> we have a couple new faces here, I want to know what you all think when people say it's hard for men to make friends, men, men to make friendships after high school. So. I was uh, watching this thing like uh, on Vice. They had like they have debates and like they had kind of like a man's panel type of thing where they they got men and they were just talking about masculinity as a whole. And that that topic came up. And 
what it really comes down to is that the reason why people feel that way is that for you to establish a friendship, there has to be a certain level of trust that you that you start to have with people, right? But for you to trust somebody, one part of being of trusting somebody is being able to be vulnerable. But guys, a shown of vulnerability is shown of lack of masculinity, kind of. It's not saying that they are intertwined with each other, but if like somebody if somebody perceives a man as being weak, it kind of it kind of almost means that they're they're not less masculine, but they're they're you can almost question their manhood a little bit. You know what I mean? Because men are supposed to be weak. Men are supposed to be strong. Men are supposed to be courageous and and all these other type of things. And all of those once you have all of these different characteristics together, then you can label yourself as a man. But you you don't do you won't you won't like put yourself in those type of situations or interactions because or you'll limit those because you don't want the world to use that against you um basically use the world use the, the world to use that against you so i feel like it's hard because nobody wants to open up their spaces to be vulnerable with somebody for 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 to not pan out the way that they exactly wanted to so it becomes a trusting. If, if somebody who's a little bit more trusting probably has an easier time finding friends because they're able to overcome some of the hurdles of 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 having a, a friendship with anybody. Some other people that is going to be a little bit more difficult because they're not going to let you in. And everybody has acquaintances. That's that surface level stuff. Like I could talk to anybody and high five them, but. For somebody, for me to tell them, hey, I'm having a bad day. Hey, my girl's really pissing me off. Like, I'm really, like, about to lose my mind. My job is killing me. Not a lot of people have that or outlets like that because, one, that's a show, like, it shows that shows that maybe you're not able to cope with your everyday life. And being able to talk it out, that is coping with your life. But some sometimes that doesn't look like your definition of what a man is supposed to, you know? What I look at that is... It's the level of intimacy you have with it. And I think the fact the way men actually bond, right? The, I think during the pandemic, they said a lot of men lost friendship because they were in the same circle they'd hang out with, right? If I go play ball at the Y every Saturday, that's my boy. My girl might be like, that's not your friend. You just play ball. I'm like, no, that's the guy who went for the past six months, see him every Saturday. He's my guy. But the thing is, I don't need to do brunch with him, but he's still my friend. And I think it goes with that vulnerability because if we're kicking on the bench, like, yo, what happened? Oh, yeah, Monday I got this thing. Oh, tell me about it. We're finding that space of commonality where we can now be vulnerable in these spaces doing that. But I think because when we look at friendships, right, what's realm, right? Sometimes I feel with the realm of with women, it has to be my best friend, bridesmaids, who's at my wedding versus, hey, can my guy come to the wedding? He's a, He don't need a plus one, but he's my guy who I hang out and bench press with every day. I look at it as we can have different level of friend or different types of friendship, but then you all look the same. I can be at the bar, see my guy in the bar every Friday. We talk about our week and we still crush him below. I don't know his last name. How many men know their boy's last name? Not it doesn't happen all the time. But I know I'm a ride for that guy if I need to, because of what he showed me up when I see his character. I know he represents. But I don't even know his name after Monday to Friday, I don't even see him. But I think sometimes people need, I need you in my pocket, need you by my side versus of in the moment, I know what you stand for. I know what you see. And there is a trust with you in that moment. So it's one of those things that I think goes down to person, right? What do I expect from a friend, right? I have best friends. I have acquaintances on different levels. But what am I really saying of who is my friend? Do I need someone I get called to? You know what? Sometimes... We have to get professional help for that. That's when you have therapists. My friends, that's just my therapist. And I think sometimes with the friendship, people put too much on that friendship that the other person is not willing to accept. Doing this show has allowed me to gain just so many decent, transformative relationships that I probably would have never had. Like, jo I met Joey at a comedy show because I did this show and somebody invited me to it who I had had on my show. I... Met, Kai was probably one of the first people to like follow me ever <laughs> when I started my, my IG accounts. So, I mean, you know, I, I've lost relationships too. And, and honestly, they weren't that decent to begin with because, I mean, heads think I'm just going to remain the same person I was in high school and be stuck with them 
in their 15 year old mentality. And, I, and listen, I'll keep this short because you both know I'm with the shits and I can go all morning. But I no longer invest in anyone who doesn't give me interest. You see, some people who were here before ain't here today. And like, I'm not going to beg anyone to pay attention to me. I'm not going out of my way to call when they should be calling me. I'm not doing any of that transactional shit. And the other thing is, too, I'll tell both of you that, well, everybody's going to see this, but it's the, the three of us talking on here. A lot of people aren't safe. Like, they'll lead you to believe that they're in your corner and they're helping you with the eaves and the studs when the whole time they're trying to build their own house on your foundation. But see, you know how, okay, I, I, I keep coming with deeper and more shit all, all the time. Wait a minute. Look at that cuss bank. Okay. Wait, wait, Chris, I guess no, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not going Chris, out the I, I, no, I have a question for you because I think a conversation, right? It goes back and forth. All the right, Kai, have... Kai, and then we got to go into my cuss bank because the cuss bank is like going up higher and higher. But go, but go ahead. Yeah, no, you, you, <laughs> you, the, quick question. The perspective you had of, if you're not there for me, it's you I don't need you anymore. What what how did you get to that enlightened point? Because some people feel that way, but they don't know how to express it and really feel like ah, I doesn't I doesn't feel good, but I so need them. Like how did you get to the point of I gotta leave you behind? Because a person you may not remember what someone did, but you remember how they made you feel. Because I don't like to feel anxious. I don't like to be upset. I'm a upbeat, happy guy, genuinely. And when something takes me out of that, I don't like that feeling because see, now I'm triggered. Now I'm going back into, you know, elementary school or being bullied or something. And I don't like that feeling. I got a lot of slack for like that type of mentality. Like, cause I compartmentalize people, which is not like, I'm the type of person, like I had plenty of relationships where, that are very one-sided. Like, the reason why we're so friends today is because I'm the one that's actively keeping this friendship alive. I can't do that. If you're okay with that, like I was okay with that. I'm okay with like, mm -hmm. we're not like, I call them like my drinking buddies. I only drink with you and you are only my drinking buddy. But if I say that, then some people are like, yo, you're, you're an asshole. You know what I mean? You're a jerk, bro. Like you good, Joey. If, if they're, if you just, just drink with them, like, why don't you like, if, if, if that's all they are to you, then what's the point of that? Like, because that's my, that's what he's, that's the point. He's, he serves one person. This is my party friend. This is my academic friend. This is my smart friend. It's my job friend. Totally. And I, I get keep, that. Like, I keep them in these certain spaces because that's where they're best utilized and that's where they best fit. But then people, people look at me as you're more, you you're, you're, you're using them for utility purposes. And I'm like, no, but also if it's one sided, I can use them any way that I want to, because they're not actively engaging back the, like the, the friendship. I can understand if I'm just drawing everything out of them and then not giving them anything back. It's actually the opposite. I'm giving them everything and I'm, I'm reaching out when it's convenient for me. And since they don't care whether I hit them up or not, then I feel like it's a, it's a mutualistic relationship like that. But it can get really dicey when you do stuff like that because it's like, are you guys really friends? Or are you guys are you just using that person to to fulfill some sort of some sort of niche or need that you have? I think it should go both ways though. Like you know, I get I totally get what you're saying because I compartmentalize also. I think a lot of people should like try to do that. That would help with a lot of just the drama we see on social media with friendships and family. But even if we are just drinking buddies, you need to be hitting me up talking about, hey, let's go have a drink too. It shouldn't be that I'm doing all of the legwork in this relationship. That shit is exhausting. You know what I'm saying? Even with, you know, like family, like it shouldn't be that I always got to call you to see my nieces and nephews. You should be calling me to see your nieces and nephews. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. Like it's just... It, it can be exhausting, but I do agree with you, Joe. I think that it's good to compartmentalize. You have to put people in different boxes and different spaces. Everybody is not meant to overlap. They're just not. Um, like years ago, I used to have like five different Facebooks. I had a Facebook <laughs> for um, people I knew from like elementary school and like growing up. I had a Facebook with people from high school. I had a Facebook with people from college. 
I had a Facebook that was kind of thotty. And I had a Facebook, you know, with my frat brothers. I mean, I just had different ones. I'm the same Chris, but I know these people from different junctures of life. Um, but someone left a comment for me on YouTube. And they said, they like my show, but they told me I have a cussing mouth. <laughs> so I said, so listen, I said, why don't I start a digital swear jar, a.k.a. a cuss bank? So right now on the screen, I have the price list up. So there's something called Watershed. And Watershed is pretty much anything you can get away with on TV after 10 p.m. And the others are self-explanatory, like combinations like motherfucker shit like that. Oh, shit. See? <laughs> but the upside is, the upside is, I'm going to donate the money to charity at the end of the season. So hopefully, hopefully some of you all out there might want to match the donation. That would be really dope. Um, these are only for me, though. You guys can talk how you want. I'm not paying for your sins. Oh, I was about to say. I was going to start firing. I'm not paying for your sins. Nope. Yeah, nope. I'm going to fire but, them off here. Nope, not not doing it. But but moving on, I usually don't do celebrity stuff on here because most of them are just like pretentious, rude, insecure assholes. But this was out in L.A. Shout out to L.A. Um, Lauren showed up late and people complained. Uh, she's so always she, late. Exactly. So so she snapped on the audience. She was like, you know, y'all lucky I made it. But I'll save my comments for now. Joey, you, you jump in, you take this, and then Kai, you go right after. Yeah, so... Like, so with Lauren Hill, like, because she's, because she has such limited amount of work and not to discredit the quality of her work, you know what I mean? Like, she, like we all enjoy her music and things like that, but she's not, she's also an older artist. She's like, there's a lot more that goes to that. So people have a different expectation of her. If Cardi B comes an hour late versus Lauren Hill coming an hour late, they're going to treat them both different because of the level of celebrity they are. You know what I mean? Also, celebrities are late. I've been to a Snoop Dogg show where he comes in an hour or two after he's supposed to be there. Show starts at eight o'clock. His set starts at eight o'clock. He's not there until ten o'clock or something like that. Beyonce was the same way. They said they 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 the the show starts at six o'clock. She doesn't really get on stage until like nine ten o'clock. So what were you doing for the three hours? Just sitting there watching watching production set up the show and that's basically what you do you just wait for the show and then once the show is there you enjoy the show it's the greatest show ever and then at the end of it you're like okay everything was worth the wait so it's it's like it, that's part of the entertainment business being late is part of that so i don't think it's anything outrageous but also people want to people are going to try to discredit her her work just because you don't, for you to be almost like you're wasting my time. You should be happy that I'm coming to see you because you have such limited work. And also with the amount of limited work, you're now you're getting mad at me for you being late. And I should be grateful that you're even performing after I paid the ticket money to even come see you. So there's a lot of things going on, but that's pretty much, I feel like that's what the sentiment is for the people. Like you're, you're doing too much now. Like, you're already like you only have five songs and i'm coming here and i already paid the 50 dollars. like the least you could do is if you're not going to be on time but don't be egregiously late because then now i feel like now now i feel disrespected at i got a story about that for kai you, you go i mean one thing you said interesting it was like it's a business right and i think with any business is a transaction right i pay for goods and services i expect those goods and services to come back and if it doesn't happen i want a refund and I think even with any other conveniences, I am um, there, there, there. There's rules and clauses for things, right? If you don't show up or something happens, I get a refund. You know, when Beyonce is going pregnant, I went to Coachella that year, the year prior. I got my money to go back and get see her the year following. I think sometimes you forget the fact of I'm enabling you to have this type of success because if I don't give you my streams, my views, or whatever, you're not going to have this. You're not going to be able to have a show. You keep making excuses. It's not just this one time. The fact that she's known for this is not just year or two, it's decades of this, right? And I think about it, again, we say business, that's her fault, the fact that she only had one body of music she can go off of. That she has to do interpretations. She didn't know the deal, she didn't do the interpretation, so now she has to do all these different things for the same album. Make new music, if that's what you really want to do, but she don't want me about the business, then don't be mad about the way the business goes out. We know music is, I won't say shady, but there's certain things of how you go about it. 360 deals or anything else, but those that have success, they have success for a reason because of the business model. If not, then there's a reason behind it, right? 
Beyonce, yeah, she might be late, but you know you're gonna get two hours, you know, the set, you know, you gotta go pause or whatever. You know what you're getting. You're getting a show stopper. Lauren Hill, is she in the mood? Beyonce might be sick, but she's gonna give you the best show. So I just look at it as if we're doing business, you gotta give me my expectations back in business. And there's no excuses. Really, worst case, cancel and see what happens the next time and we'll go from there. That mm. again, that's not how I do it. It's just the fact of Kai is I, the finance guy. So <laughs> anything Kai says is going to go back to money. So as Kai is talking, all I keep hearing in my head is if somebody doesn't show up to the show, dispute, dispute, dispute. Get on the phone with your credit card company and keep <laughs> that shit. I mean, but, buy, this, buy but here's cards. my thing. Here's my thing. <laughs> so <laughs> with age comes compassion. So the me of 25, would have probably been like, fuck her, she only got one and a half albums, she ain't no Beyonce. But the me of today understands that Lauren could be going through something. And if I'm going to go to one of her shows, I need to bring snacks, I need some Uno cards, maybe a folding chair and a puzzle or something to keep myself occupied while I wait. But I mean, I also know how to separate the artist from the art. Because she has exhibited some bratty, ungrateful behavior to her fans. But so has R. Kelly. And years ago, I went to that Best of Both World show back in the day at the Garden, with, um, when he showed up like six hours late because he was up at Rutgers playing basketball and eating at Sylvia's and shit. Yeah. But I was there for the music. And granted, he's done some fucked up shit that landed him in prison. But his artistry is undeniable. Now, he wouldn't get my money today, but, you know, anyway. Kai, what's in your Shazam? I find myself at a, a, a crux of my life right now where, you know, being a millennial, listening to the old school is something that makes me feel good. But then old school nowadays, if you go to 94.7 in New Jersey, New York City, it's Nelly and all the other stuff, the 2000s, and that's old school nowadays. And it's weird. It's like, oh, shit, what happened to this remix? But at the same time, being in New York, being on the block, if I'm, you know, hanging out and doing community service with some of the young boys, where are they listening to, right? Where's that connection point? So one thing is really understanding of this crux of drill. And for me, I grew up on Chicago drill. Chief Keys, Little Dirk, we're talking Little Reese, all that stuff that I was drill. Now this new stuff, you can't keep remixing, you know, Ray J's One Wish, and now I'm like, wait, when is it going to drop? It's something else. So it's always when I'm on the radio, like, I'm getting ready to be like, yeah. And I'm like, wait, what? Who's this? Groovy B and little whatever. I'm like, I don't even know. But it's honestly just trying to see what's the new scene of New York. But the thing is, it's trying to be hit. But I'm also learning. I got to stay in my lane. I'm getting more and more when I go out. I listen to what I want to listen to. Honestly, it's all the new stuff that I'm just like, you're t- when any song is less than a two and a half minutes, I question it. But you know, that's social media's fault. That's social media's fault. That's these fucking record executives, they, you know, that, that are trying to tie like everything. They don't, have, they don't have attention spans anymore. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you mentioned something, and then Joey, I'm going to go to you with this. But you mentioned something about The Block, 94.7, shout out to The Block, um, playing, you know, like stuff like Nelly, like stuff that we remember because we're all around the same age. And my mother listens to a station down in Philly and it's called Classics. It's 107.9, I wanna say. And it's so funny when I go visit her and I hear Crush On You, and I'm like, when I used to play this, you hated this. But now, this is your station, so they're playing all the songs that I grew up on, and they're not playing the stuff that you grew up on, because it's way, way back in the day, you got to get a serious, you know, subscription for that. But now you don't have any other choice. But um, Joey, what's in your Shazam? Um, so my Shazam, like, I'm more of a like music astronaut. I like to like, if I'm like, I might be at a like a Korean hot pot, and then I might just Shazam something in like something in the background, or I know like there was an American Eagle. I was at American Eagle. American Eagle or like Express, they always got a banger in the background somewhere. So I'll just Shazam something like that. So 
I don't know exact songs. Like, there's nothing like that is coming straight to my brain as like, oh, I you got to hear this. But definitely, like, if something catches my ear just in passing, that's what I'll shizz in because I won't know what that is right off the top of my head. And then if um once I shazam it, then I'll put that into my Spotify and and add that to my like list and playlist like that. So about. 500 of my like 1800 shazams because i'm just looking th through them like about 500 of them are, are smooth jazz and yo i love smooth jazz like when i'm in a car i put on the uh the watercolors channel and it makes me feel like really classy you know like driving around with the smooth jazz on. <laughs> that new andre 3000 album listen the andre andre has like outdone himself with this album it came out last week so listen Listen, guys, it's only like 10 tracks, but the tracks are like 20 minutes a piece. Like it's it's a freaking like he's playing instruments. It's, there's very little rapping on there, but it's it's like it's an experience. Like it is it is an immersive experience. Andre 3000 had an interview talking about how he's 48 and he's like, as you get older, you can not rap like you were like how you used to when you were younger. Like not saying that he, he gave up on rap, but meaning that he he doesn't still have that same um like not saying relevancy but it's he's like i don't like he's not young anymore he's a 48 almost 50 year old man so the things that he's rapping about are not going to be the same th like he's not he's not in the club popping bottles and doing all these other type of things like you assume he's like what he said was kind of funny he was like what am i supposed to rap about like i have to go get a colonoscopy or something like that and i thought that was kind of crazy because that's yeah we're, we're older now if you got the what do you a, a 50 year old rapper what is he rapping about well there's some 50 year old rappers rapping about the young boy shit but they have ghost writers and it's obvious we're not going to say who but, but you know just saying. it's rap's only genre where you can't get old you have rock and roll artists, you too start making albums, right? And they're yeah. people still love it. Rap, you're 48. It's like, woo, I mean, you're pushing it. You know what? The fact look at the Nas has a reemergence, right? Nas is dropping Nas is, bigger, 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 bigger. Nas is a monster though. Nas is, and, yeah. and he and he talks about being he doesn't he was never he's he's more lyrically like better than other people that he doesn't have to talk about. He could talk about all the things that he's doing, business ventures and things like that. You don't have to talk about bitches and hoes. Yes. But E-40's still yeah. doing the same thing and having fun on the West Coast. Like, I, I, it, it's but weird. now, that's a totally different type of rap. Like, that's some, like, that's that hyphy, that's that dance rap. Like, he could do that forever. They're acts with literally one foot in the grave. And people, re listen, people refinance their houses Billy Joel, just Joel, to get tickets. Does it? I, my mom took me to go see uh, Philly Collins <laughs> like a year ago. Like I was, I seen Phil Collins and he sat the whole time. Yes. He's that old, but I still enjoyed it. Phil Collins in Exactly. Genesis. He's dope. <laughs> He's dope. But, but I'm sure that that place was crowded, Joe. It, it was, was crowded. Not a, it was standing room only. It was crazy. See? See what I mean? But then our acts, like our R&B acts, some of our funk and soul acts, they can barely sell tickets because people are like, oh, they're old. Why you want to go see that? Like, but this is our music. These are our people who shaped and formed our musical culture. And you're not supporting them. Do you guys have any favorite Christmas songs? Kai, I'm going to go to you first. You know what? I think talk about music and variability. I have a specific artist. Every artist had a Christmas album. The ones that come to mind are uh, TLC's Christmas album. Real Talk. Bangers and Sync's Christmas album. They had some bobs on that. You know, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Like, let's go off, JC. But <laughs> to be told, <laughs> NSYNC, TLC, uh, Mariah Carey, pretty much everyone had that Christmas album. I think Whitney had one too. Like, it's a thing. Even Bryson Tiller has a Christmas album. Like, that's how it's actually fire, though. I'm not gonna listen. lie. We need the OJs, we need the Silent Nights. So that's why I get excited for the, the, our versions of Christmas. <laughs> Go ahead, Joey. Um, I like controversial Christmas songs like "The Baby Is Cold Outside." Like, I used to, I like that song. I always thought it was a funny song. But I just found out I, it was controversial last year. I didn't I know no it got rapey, and then it, then it, then they then you read the lyrics, and it, I'm like, yeah, but this is like 
and, and you gotta remember, this is like 1960, I think, seven sixty seventies or something when that song came out. So probably before that was yeah. definite. Yeah, it could be even older. I just know that in 2023, everything got a little rapier. So I don't know, but that uh, yeah, baby is cold outside. Still, uh, still takes the cake as as one of my favorites for sure. Baby, it's cold outside. Was written in 1944. Exactly. And popularized in the 1949 film Neptune's Daughter. So okay. 1944, that's, that's like 79 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you got to think of how things were back then. I mean, people were getting married in their teens. Yes, for then, sure. And no one <laughs> batted an eyelash. Um, but for me, but for me, one of my all-time favorites is This Christmas, Donny Hathaway. And I used to play the 45 single over and over and over as a kid on my mom's record player. And shout out to my mom. She's watching it. And a lot of people, um, depending on where they grew up, hearing it on the radio, don't know about the reframe in that record. And I can tell where folks grew up by how they sing it. Like if you so, Joey, you grew up in, in New York. You grew mm -hmm. up probably listening to BLS and Kiss. They played it on BLS and Kiss. Okay. But when you grew up, they didn't necessarily play that full version on the radio. Right. Um, also, Denise Williams, Do You Hear What I Hear? I have that on repeat when I'm in the gym this time of the year because it's, it's very boppy. Um, what else? Luther, My Favorite Things, Best of My Love by The Emotions. Even though Best of My Love isn't a Christmas record, it just puts me in the spirit. I mean, Madison Avenue pretty much made it a Christmas record, and it's in C major. And if you're a music person, you know that C major is one of the Christmas song keys. And something else, um, this is gonna sound crazy, but like, you know, I just, I go down a rabbit hole musically. Soon as I get home by Faith Evans, always sounded like a Christmas song to me. And that's in A flat minor. It's a kind of a sad key, but they're all good records. At the Luther record, I play it all year round. Fight me a little bitch. So I <laughs> all year round. But let me get your thoughts on this. So there's at least one expert who believes that the singularity, the moment when AI, artificial intelligence, surpasses the control of humans, could be just a few years away. That's a lot shorter than current predictions regarding the timeline of AI dominance, especially considering that AI dominance is not exactly guaranteed in the first place. Ben Gertzel, CEO of Singularity Net, who holds a PhD from Temple University, and has worked as a leader of Humanity Plus and the Artificial Intelligence, I'm sorry, Artificial General Intelligence Society, told Decrypt that he believes AI General Intelligence, or AGI, is three to eight years away. AGI is the term for AI that can truly perform tasks just as well as humans. And it's a prerequisite for the singularity soon following. Joey, you're the science guy. I want you to take this. So AI is uh, it's like the gift and the curse. It's um it's it's that it's that Pandora's box. Like it's it's like modern medicine. It's like anything like that it can be used for good or good or used for bad. Like in and of itself, it's not a bad thing. Like my friends are using Chat GBT to rewrite emails or to formulate whatever they need to. But I used it also, for the show. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Also, you have you have it where there was a, a scientist. He he has um, he uses the AI to make different molecules that will help people like will help that will be used to make medicines. But he was also thinking like he did like a little experiment just for a day and it spooked him so bad that he actually canceled it. He said, well, if I can make the AI give me a list of of good drugs, let's say. What if I change the algorithm to instead of it being the one, let's make it zero. So it gives me the opposite. Let me find the he said, like the things that were least toxic. What are the least toxic materials? And then he turned the AI to make what make show me the combination of the most toxic material. And then when the AI started spitting out real like things that he could make or things like that, it kind of sp scared him. He was like, what if other people are doing this? We can have an outbreak or those those rogue agent type of things that can be a really real thing and seeing how fast these things can go 
it only takes one little mistake. Like, oh, I didn't mean for it to go like that. I said, I said the I said the autonomous robot free into the world, and now we can't find him anymore because he's blended in with everybody. So now, now we're in a different like in a different type of situation. So it's it can be very real and everything like that. So I it's hey I don't I don't really know. I look at it from two perspectives. One, responsible AI, just like facial recognition software, right? You have to have the responsibility of the companies to say, does the good outweigh the bad? What are my parameters of the logistics of the standards of going, of, of you know, practices? What are the regulations? You know, what can we do and what can we not do with this? Because at the sake of profits, are releasing something that's, un, you know, censored? What about aunts, cousins, aunties that don't know how to work in their job because they're at the lower skill wages? How do you make an inclusive future of work that everyone can participate, make the money to do things, right? We can upskill, we can learn a new skill, but cousin who just got out, he's not really going to learn how to be this. He has sort of limitations. So if AI is being used to replace those lower wage jobs, what are they supposed to do? And not everyone can work at Amazon. So in the work I did and got published and researched for, those understanding of how do you make sure that the work is something that people can participate in the future? Because, you know, look at the pandemic. Someone might be a cashier and they're thinking, oh, I'm losing hours in the store. No, we're getting more self-checkouts, which is more technology in the workplace. It's not because you're losing hours, because you're getting replaced. But now what do you do next? You don't have the skills. You don't have upskill. You don't know how to use chat GPT. You don't know the prompts. So how do you ensure that companies and everyone's responsible, your local governments to say, I'm going to make sure that people can upskill for the future. So that way, they're not having as many benefits of welfare on me. They're actually contributing back with their taxes. So this is actually the biggest thing that people need to worry about is the fact of people are losing jobs if you can't upskill. And what does upskill look like right now? It's no more than in Python and this. How do you need to be? What's a prompt engineer? That's a new role that came out in the past 24 months. People really need to learn about how do I participate because, oh, I don't need that. You ask people, right? Uncles in their 50s or aunts, they're 55, they're close to retirement. If AI is going to replace your job, what are they supposed to do? Be a Walmart greeter? They're not, they can't retire yet. They don't have the money. They need to be able to do that, but they're going to learn a whole new technology at their age. So what are we doing with this? The fact of it's not just what it can do for the future, you know, terminators more so how can someone make a nine to five off of this? Knowing that they're going to get replaced and no one's thinking about that. But then in five years, you're going to be like, yeah, yeah, replace my computer. I don't know what to do now. And no one's thinking about that, but we are able to upscale, but how do we make sure the rest of our community can do the same? And no one's thinking about that because not just no one wants to be a coder. No one wants to code. I need to be able to make it means for me and my two kids, but I don't know how to because no one taught me about these different technologies because I was I was not part of the inclusive future of that work. So honestly, it's more so how do we work with colleges, workforce programs to say, hey, these are the jobs and skills you need to train people. So that way, in two or three years, they can get somewhere. They're not just a cashier. They're actually not stuck. But it's always a problem until it's, it's too late. And we yeah. always get left behind. So what can we do for our leaders in our community to say, I'm taking care of my, my fellow black friends and say, hey, learn this thing or be aware how this works. You know, we all have iPhones, but are you actually using it for the full advantage or no? A lot of people aren't. And so that's my concern of how do you make sure that people can work? Because I'm not concerned about me. I'll learn this. But my brothers, my cousins, and this is the thing they're saying, people in the art. If you're an artist, you're losing it because now we're generating it. So honestly, I'm more concerned about how do you make sure that people can actually work versus, you know, getting replaced and things like that. I am so glad that I picked both of you for this. Both of you are hitting on everything that I'm going to talk about in this video. And just anyway, Joey, you was going to say something. I just had to say yeah. that. Because um, when he, he, he brought up art, which is interesting because art is something that is super subjective. Can a, can a machine make art? And technically a machine can make anything. But is that still classified as art? That's right. the question. I mean, is, I look at with the the, uh, the writer strike, right? They were going to use people's likeness to say, "Hey, I got your capture image, <laughs> and I can use your image for in, in perpetuity for the rest of your life." I don't need you as actor anymore. That's and crazy. that's why you see all these sites with like, "Oh, give me your image." If you're like, "Stop using this," even YouTube just came out with something, right? They're like, "You got to label it as AI generated content now on YouTube, or it won't be posted." And so art is subjective, but I'm not going to pay five thousand dollars that someone didn't actually make. Like, if, I, if and that's the thing about art because it's the value placed on by the beholders. And we're all going online. It's like NFTs, right? NFTs had a value, and now it was art, but now those things sell for $300,000 and now we're worthless.
And that's the, the subject is the technology. So I just look at it as art. It, it's subjective at the same time. We're losing a form because now where's the actual soul behind it, I guess. You know, like, remember, it's like the record label. They had that one rapper that uh, my friend would tell me on Sony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But it was, it was a white generated saying the N-word. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but that's art. It's music, right? But at the same time. Using it for bad. Using it for bad. So Gertzel says that singularity could be in place by 2031 which really isn't far from now. And here's my thing. We get all of these technological advancements, but they keep getting made in the wrong direction. Like if this is going to help close with the digital divide, then I'm all for it. But it's probably going to be used for some iRobot nonsense. I mean, here's a stat for you all. 98% of the internet is inaccessible to people with disabilities. So how about they spend that money to truly close, just truly eliminate equity gaps? Like, I just want to wrench edit and bell tree win on, on this AI shit sometimes, man. <laughs> Little Windows joke. But now something I didn't know was that AI was driven by the military as a national defense tool. And that's interesting because the development of the internet was funded by the Department of Defense. It wasn't uh, Al Gore or... or um, Beyonce or whoever it is that y'all say it's their internet. Michelle Barack's uh, internet? <laughs> yeah, it, it, no, come on. Um, I mean, the digital divide, though, is is why a lot of people end up getting scammed on social media. And, and Kai, Joey, I feel it coming. I feel it coming. And, 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 and you know that the cuss bank is about to go up. It's about to explode. Mm -hmm. So here's my deal. Here's my deal. Here's my thing. People also get scammed because they'd rather watch and listen to some popular bullshit garbage from some unlikable motherfucker than to actually get educated by an expert. I mean, you got dumbasses out here paying thousands of dollars for seminars and courses and scam brunches to quote unquote learn from some scam likely head asses some shit that they can learn online for free. I mean, like who raised you? Seriously. Yeah. And and the more I think we're moving forward as a society, social media just lets me know that we're not. Like, we've regressed so much in the last six years that it's not even funny. And and honestly, those solar flares can't come soon enough, but... <laughs> Blow the air. Blow the air. It's funny that, um, remember back in the day, that meme, like, read a book, motherfucker, read a book, read a book. That whole, like, commercial that happened. And it caught people off guard, but it's like, yo, who's actually reading? And it's tough because, like, you want to save your fellow man, but I got to take care of myself. But I just worry that at times we need something may talk from a position of privilege and say, oh, you should do this and do whatever. But not everyone has the privilege to do that. And then sometimes put myself in those shoes and those people and say, I get why you got scammer, why you got the Forex trading. I don't need to know what Guatemalan dollar is on the dollar right now, but. Someone told you you can make two hundred dollars right now. You're gonna do that because you need that two hundred dollars. That's why you have payday loans. I need that money right now. I don't know the terms, the conditions, everything, and it's tough because I want to save, but at the same time, that's that person can situation. They need that. Like sometimes people need these things, and it hurts them in the long run. Scam is gonna scam, my boy. That's that's his that's his life. Because they were that was like I've seen that on the news too. They were talking about. Dudes are getting uh, fembotted out of money and stuff like that, out of thousands and thousands of dollars, thinking that they're talking to the... Of course, he's the most beautiful girl that you've ever seen, and she says that she loves you, and can you send her something so that she can buy the ticket to come fly out to wherever you're at and things like that. Like, people people want these type of interactions. Like, like human-to-human -human interaction is what people are still need and that's part of life and that's very important but now that we have the technology we can insert the technology into that person-to-person -person interaction and they're doing it in a malicious way actually so that they can take advantage of people because these people if they had those interactions naturally in their lives then they wouldn't have to seek it online or to you know what i mean like if you if they had if everybody had significant others then there would be no online dating so if there was like, if there was these, if there was these basically, what am I trying to say? If there are these um, resources out there for the people, then they wouldn't be getting scammed. But since they aren't, 
this is an easy opportunity for somebody who has who's being predatorial and, and taking advantage of people. Despite how people act online, this isn't high school. This is real adult grown up life. We have notes and bills and responsibilities. Like we don't have time for grifts and grabs. I mean, this is why I gave everyone some shopping tips at the top of the show for the holidays. People are trying to stretch their funds and the average American can't afford to throw some money at someone on social media asking for money. I mean, especially someone who lacks legitimate expertise in that field of human endeavor. I mean, you wouldn't get dental work done by your barber. Well, wait now, some of y'all yeah, would. Someone will, some of y'all yeah. would. Yeah. I did a show at the top of the year <laughs> with my, re my realtor friend, Terry, and on that show, he told you all, don't be buying houses without a real estate agent. I'm going to take it even a step further, and then I'm going to move along because we have more topics. Stop giving these imps and simps your hard-earned money just because they're popular. Stop sacrificing quality, safety, and security. Remember the Simpsons had that Halloween episode where the ads came to life, and they were like, just don't look. Just don't look. Like, the Simpsons be knowing that. <laughs> and stop flocking to these narcissists on social media. Just stop. They're going to leave you holding the bag. If a nigga talking fast that he can't put shit in black and white, red motherfucking flag. Lie to get by, choose to confuse. But see, that's what you all love. You don't want facts and experts. You want fast and easy. That's how you got gooped and gagged at that financial expo. Better stop giving those shifty difty charlatans your money. It'll end your life. Beware the conscious folks too. But you know, literacy plays a part in people getting caught up in scams. People don't read. Either they don't know how to, or they don't feel like it. And for the latter, their ignorance leads to their detriment. Like I said earlier, don't invest in anyone or anything that doesn't give you interest. Oh, and to any of you frauds who choose to respond to what I've said on here, be wise, because my show comes up in my search results. Scammer comes up in yours. Remember that. That article, by the way, um, was from Popular Mechanics. We, fref we reference all kinds of sources here at the Chris David Show. But I just, I just hate seeing us get taken advantage of. I, I, I hate it, especially by greedy motherfuckers who have more than enough. But anyway. How do you feel I'm, about GoFundMe's? And rent. GoFundMe's, do I believe every cause? So everything? GoFundMe, here's the thing with GoFundMe. Because I, I, I've had people on who have GoFundMes and they're truly raising money for a cause, you know, like something unfortunate happened in their lives, you know. It depends on where it's coming from. If you're coming from a pure place, if you're coming from somewhere where, you know, you, like you had an event in your life, something unfortunate happened and you truly need help, okay, fine. But I'm not doing a GoFundMe for you um, to buy your kid, uh, you know, a PS5. Because your kid doesn't need a PS5. I'm not doing a GoFundMe for you for a Goyard bag. I'm not. You know, like, I'll tell you guys a story. A friend of my sister um, had ended up being, she was in danger of being evicted. My brother-in-law says, why are y'all donating to her GoFundMe? Tell her to sell some of those handbags she's got. She's got over a thousand handbags. So, I mean, anyway, what did you two do for Thanksgiving? Well, I'm here in Orlando, so um, I flew out. So I have family here in Florida and um, we every other year we we try to bring all of us because it's hard to get some of us are in New York, Pennsylvania. It's hard to get us all together, bring the band back together. So um, every other year we uh, have Thanksgiving and we we rent the rent the the party house a nice uh, big airbnb with five five to seven rooms everybody has their own room the kids get to jump in the pool and we all have a we have a instead of it being cold we have a nice hot florida thanksgiving love it nice kai what about you bar food sleep <laughs> nice and then you know get up the next day and hang out with me um yeah. so for me we went to my cousin's house. We Trini, so we had a lot of curry, everything. Um, it was nice. You know, we played games, drank brown liquor, had a good time. Shout out to my cousin, Michelle, and her husband, Matt, and all my cousin's season's greetings, but more like season's beatings. 
Y'all thought that Timberwolves game was wild? Wait till I tell you what went on at Walmart this morning. But anyway, we have another letter. We have another letter. You guys, you, re you guys ready for this one? Let's get it. All right. So this young lady named Anonymous, she's 22, and she's from Joey's neck of the woods, uh, Long Island. Okay. She says, I really don't know how to say this, but I've been dealing with this guy from my job that I liked, uh, really liked a lot. We've been on dates, and he's met my friends and family. After we had sex, he turned on the lights unexpectedly and kept gazing at it. Ooh. I asked him what he saw or if something was wrong. He asked me if I had ever been in an accident or something. I asked him what kind of accident and told him just get to the point. He said, how come I'm one color and my girl is darker? I told him not everyone is the same color all over and that our nipples usually tell what color we are down there. He laughed and said, but you are light. I just didn't expect it to be so ugly. Disrespectful. Like, full <laughs> stop. Disrespectful. So I cried for the first time ever after sex. I've never been so hurt by someone I cared about before. Now everything is awkward because we haven't spoken since that day and we work together. What should I do? And I'm going to just say this. They don't pay me enough for this. So one of you guys, just go. Just take it away. I never seen an ugly. I didn't, I didn't know that a kitty could be ugly. They're, they're body parts. You know what I mean? They're, that's like, a, I don't know. That's kind of crazy. Honestly, what, what I, have, I have conversations with my friends because it's crazy how the world works. So the rise of like Twitch streamers and all these influencers and stuff is creating a new type of incel, right? There's men don't know how to interact with women or even see what a woman looks like. I was, let's see a soft clip online. One of Kai Sense boys had a stream and he pick, put a picture of a girl who's thick, cute, all that. People in the comments like, oh, she's ugly, she's this, she's fat. He goes, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know what a real woman looks like? You're so used to Instagram models and all these different things and the porn. You don't actually know how to talk. Even the term res, right? I hate this term res because I'm like, oh, you're risen up. You mean talk to a woman? Because I'm actually engaging and say, hey, I like you. You want to go out? Oh, he got the riz. He's talking to people. The newer generation. How do you men. even spell that? Is it R-I-Z-Z? -Z? Yes. Yeah, riz. Yeah. Riz. -Z. And that's God, the thing. You're making a new classification of black incels because they never had to interact with black women in general. So when they see someone in real time, it's not what they expect, right? It's not the Pornhub, it's not the Instagram, it's not the DMs, it's none of the stuff I saw online. It's a real natural woman, and they know how to react. So you're getting comments at like 22. Who is he following, right? Who is he listening to to say, this is wrong about your body that she grew up with, right? What is his, what is he, where is he coming from? So I just look at it, the fact of there's obviously wrong with the generation where no one knows what natural looks like anymore. I think it's also another thing about it is that when you're – if you're going into a, a like a sexual encounter for the first time, you you might like if you have a bump down, like let's say that you have a pimple by your crotch area, somebody might be like, oh, that might be a disease. Like, no, it's just a pimple. But I've never seen your anatomy before, so I don't know what that is. That could be foreign to me or it could be normal. But that might be the way that he him saying is ugly. That's being disrespectful. He just, he went straight for the he went straight for the touchdown with that. But. <laughs> I like he might not have been used to it. Like some some kitties are some kitties are like had big lips. Some don't. Some are some are like nice and nice and like look like plastic. You know, like they look like the pornos, and some of them look like like whatever they look like. They all they, you know what I mean. They are like a they're a flower. They look all different. So he might be used to ones that look naturally different. But I mean, that's not to say it's ugly or not, but. He went for it though. That's kind of that's kind of very uh, bold of him to I go for. I think we it. need to acknowledge the obvious though, and and this is what I want to know. So if you're watching, I want you to let me write me back. Is she dealing with a non-black man? Because I'm not really seeing too many of us brothers calling something that we've just been up in ugly just because it's dark. And then again, I'm from a different era. Like I didn't partake in that misogynoir on early Twitter, but. Anyway, Anonymous, I'm sorry you had to deal with this. I think you need to move on. Let him find someone who's monochromatic or thin or has light eyes or a fatty or whatever physical attributes he deems pretty. And you're 22. 
as a much older man, I'm just going to tell you, you don't need to change yourself to anyone. If he doesn't love you for who you are, he doesn't love you. And you know what you do to Anonymous? Find someone who can't stop looking at it. Because trust me, he's out there. And I just, like, guys, I can't believe that in 2023, 2024, people are still weaponizing things that, about people that they can't change. I mean, like, this is why people cheat hard body. Like, they're with someone who has something they don't like, and instead of just breaking up, they go out and cheat with the person who has what they think they like. All the while, the issue is within themselves. Y'all gotta ignore those narcissists, man. But anyway, Anonymous, write us back. Let us know if this guy you're messing with is black. And for fuck's sake, stop dating people at work. Speaking of cheaters, <laughs> speaking of cheaters, do you guys watch that show, Cheaters? Uh, not since he got pulled. Since they stabbed him. Ooh. Nah, that was the last time. Yeah. Oh, Peter Guns is hosted. This shit is hilarious. Oh, it is? So, I gotta watch so Peter listen, Guns. so listen, so listen. So the hosts, they instigate like crazy. And rest in peace to uh, the guy, Clark Gable. Um, but he put the battery in this one guy's back. He was like, he was like this IT guy. And he had like these 300, these big Coke bottle glasses, like 300 time mag magnification. So <laughs> he had homie amped up. So he busts up in the crib and he pushes the guy who his girl is cheating with. He pushes, pushes his head into the pissy toilet. And then there's another episode that is, this is a Peter Guns episode. And it's this, this Wale looking guy. And he got this guy so fired up that they almost come to blows. Like Peter's in the phone, like he's showing in the tablet. He's showing him the video and he's like, yeah, he feeling all up on your girl and, and, and sliding her to D. And homie just huh? loses it. Like he just like, loses it. But what, but what really gets me though with cheaters is how they stay lying on the phone. Like they don't even try. Cause there's this one episode, an old girl was on her knees on some hookers at the point type shit. And she's like, oh, She's like, I'm at the supermarket with my grandma. Like, what the, what the hell? But shout out to Dallas, though, because that's where the, a lot of the, the cheaters are. Um, do you guys Not watch House Hunters, though? Speaking of shows, do you guys watch House Hunters? No. I, no, I can't afford it. I'm in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> good one. No, that's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, House Hunters is one of my favorites, though. Like, I like Little John had a show, too. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the show, but on the weekend on the own channel, um, they show like all the episodes with like black home buyers. And I think that's really dope. But here's the thing with, with what I what I've noticed. People bring the wrong friends and family with them to see these houses like they end up projecting their insecurities onto them and, and you know, onto their search. And another thing I noticed, like people like be so adamant about getting fixer uppers like there was this homeless couple and. They picked the fixer upper instead of picking the house that was just like moving ready, that was maybe like 10 grand more. But the fixer upper, they're going to have to put like 30 grand into. And I just don't think that first time home buyers should be fixing up a home. But you know, they brought uh, cribs back too, MTV cribs. I seen that. Yeah, I seen yeah. that. They did bring cribs. I mean, now listen, I'm going to say this Red Man had the best episode. In Cribs history. Ah, oh, you laughing because you remember Red Man's episode. It was he real. Did. It was real. He did. But I, I just think, but this is my thing. I just think that bringing back Cribs now in, in this economy that we're living in is just a little tone deaf because mortgage rates are like seven, eight percent. Like most people can't swing that. Or like Kai, you mentioned you in Brooklyn, you can't buy no house. I mean. Most people can't do the, the down payment. It's just like MTV is just like grabbing for straws at this point anyway. I mean, but they, is it is, is the new crib? Do they own the houses or are they I not the same. houses? That's the thing. My, See, my sister that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. I don't I don't think that they knowing how celebrities operate. I don't think that they do actually own these homes. I think that they may be just like rented or they may be Airbnbs that they're staying at or some shit. But anyway, MTV. I got a show idea for you. So holla at your boy. But I'm gonna tell you guys this. Somebody DM'd me and they asked me, did I wanna be on this reality show? And like, it was legit. Like it was a scout. They were like, you fit the criteria, the demographic we're seeking. 
DM us back if you be, you know, considered, you want to be considered for casting. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm not going to be imping and simping on some damn fuckboy island 2.0. So, it, uh, it's but, not uh, Zeus Network. Yeah, like, I'm Zeus. not doing <laughs> stupid shit. Come on. Nah, you know what's funny? So, during the pandemic, during the pandemic, um, I made it to Final Round of Love is Blind season two. And I was all about it. Like, I want to show love for, you know, being a cluster size male, all this other stuff. But yeah. then thinking through it, right, I didn't realize, yes, maybe I can find the love of my life and this would be perfect. This is my story. But can I deal with the backlash, right? Not everyone's going to love me, right? How are they going to edit me? And can I be like, you know, chilling at home and all of a sudden I see the comments like, fuck that man. Like, this is a random person. Can my ego handle that? And honestly, I backed out because I didn't know if I was ready to be a public figure for something mm. that I wasn't trying to be a public figure for. Right. And the day show, it's like, well, I actually believe in the science or whatever it's doing, but then do I believe that person in Kansas who wrote a whole blog about me, right? That was tough. So I backed <laughs> away from it because I couldn't handle the fact of my life's a public figure. The more I go, I go to work. Oh, you're the love is blind guy. That way, like, no, yeah. like, you know too much about me, and I don't want you to know that. And I just couldn't handle the public figure. Me. And I think that's the big thing with fame or anything. It's like, no matter how big or small, MLK with random people commenting on my life the way they want to. Right. Yeah. Kai, yeah. what are you doing for the holidays? What are you doing for uh, Christmas and New Year's? Uh, Christmas right now, um, it's a double dip between spending time with some friends in D.C., family, and New Year's. I'm trying to be out somewhere. That sucks. Just out and about just... <laughs> <laughs> living up i'm trying to get you know a black great gatsby <laughs> nice i feel you listen listen you you find this the place you invite your boys all right hey, let's do Joey, it what are you doing what are you doing for christmas and new year's if we do um we do family stuff then i end up going um just staying more local and then we'll i'll probably be in pennsylvania uh you could you could find me at your, your local king of prussia mall probably <laughs> uh, <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, I traveled all summer, so I, I, I've just been on my chill. I'm reclaiming my black time. I'm off work till next year, so I'm just going to be on the couch watching uh, Black Cake and, and some cheesy Christmas movies. Yo, do y'all watch those cheesy Christmas movies? Joey, oh, listen, I know I, listen, I know Brittany has you watching those movies. Yeah, you got to watch <laughs> A Christmas Story. A Christmas Story has to happen at least one time every Christmas. Yeah. You got to shoot your eye out every shoot your eye out every Christmas, you know? You know, you gotta do the black you gotta do the black version as well from BET. But honestly, my new like favorite genre is the um hood movies on Amazon Prime, where it's someone from Detroit, 20k budget, you see the boom mic in it, but it's always about like plug love or something like that. And you're just like, I wanna oh, turn the- away, but this is fire. It's the Tubi movies, like wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to say that the Tubi movies, yeah, nah, those are those are those are kind of crazy. <laughs> they're they're are really good crazy. though. Like some of them are really good. Like the the plot lines are just they remind me of African movies. Mm-hmm, they are Hollywood <laughs> and the and the, and the <laughs> Ghanaian movies. Yeah, that's what they remind me of. I mean, I watch the the holiday movies, but they start to be predictable after a while because it's like he or she has a big important job, comes home for the holidays. Links up with the guy or the girl they liked in high school. Mm-hmm. Can't stand each other, love each other, fight, get engaged, and seen. But you yeah. know, now I, I can share this with you guys. Something dawned on me the other day, and this isn't with, even with the Christmas movies. Like, don't, don't, but, 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 don't those regular Lifetime movies look like black porns? Ah, like- see, see, see. It's the same lens filter. Like, it's the same lens filter. The actresses are, like, nondescript. The music be the same. <laughs> like, I was watching one the other night with the crazy psycho uh, yoga instructor, and there was the scene where they had the threesome. And I'm like, yo, it's giving blacked. <laughs> I-Y-K-Y-K. Speaking of porn, have you guys seen the AI porn? that people are generating now? I've never seen AI porn, but because I'm a porn enthusiast, that's like a, don't tell anybody. Um, oh, Joey, they know now. They, yeah. Joey, they knew when you came on the, the, the camera. They knew. 
uh, that um that I that I'm into the uh, the occult life. Yeah, I'm into everything. Mm. Everything. They everything knew about Kai I'm, too. I'm cool with it. So um, they have anime porn. I'm into anime, so they have that too. So I guess that's like AI porn also. <laughs> I mean, but this. Kai, have you seen it? Have you seen the AI porn? I haven't. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm more of a vanilla guy. Matt Gaskin is a little exotic, but nothing too crazy. Okay. You know? <laughs> All right. All but right. I, I hope you point... guys are ready. Because <laughs> I'm gonna show you something. I'm not gonna put this up in the video, but I'm just gonna okay. So this is what's going this is what's going on in AI porn. Look, 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 look at her head. <laughs> no, three six. This is what's going on. And then they got, I mean, this is, see, this isn't for me, because this, this shit is real uncanny. That looks more like 3D porn. They have 3D porn that's like that. Like, it's, it's like, But it's nuts, though. Like, why is her head, like, completely swiveled around, like, on some exorcist shit? Yeah. Like, and, and, and look at this. They got things coming out of places that shouldn't be, like, that. Oh, they got hand penises. <laughs> a hand cock. <laughs> that's a hand cock. For sure. I can't. No, no king I just, shaming. No king shaming. <laughs> This is, this is just it's too much. It's, it's way too much. I mean, anyway, but with the Christmas movies, I mean, if Tatiana Ali, Akisha Knight, Pulliam are in the movies, I'll watch because Ashley and Rudy are still my crushes. Mm -hmm. I love a brown skin cutie. All right. But Joey put me on to this documentary called Torn. And Torn is about a rock climber named Alex Lowe who perished in an avalanche in Tibet back in 1999. His best friend and climbing partner, Conrad Anker, survived the avalanche. And after uh, Alex's death, Conrad and Alex's widow, Jenny, fell in love and married. Now, here's the question of the day, question of the week, probably the question of the century. If you were to die in a freak accident, Kai, does your homie get your blessing to link up with your mate? That's a tough one, but if it's they find comfort in overcoming, remember me together. I guess so. Like, hey, I'm not there to stop their happiness. <laughs> I mean, you did. How can you? Exactly. But in all honesty, though, it's it's. I think it, it, even relations, right? You protect your boy's girl, right? If my boy's not around and my his girl, I'll make sure she's alright and she's good. In the same way, this is them doing the ultimate respect of doing so. <laughs> I'm not around for definitely making sure she's all right. Um, you know, I think honestly, it, it, it's tough because I'm not there. But life, it's like even you get five hundred dollars, life moves on. Life's gonna go on with them here or not. So hey, more power to them. You know, make sure my my kids remember me. <laughs> Joey, what about you? Are you, are you allowing your homie to? I, to, to, I, to... I, Take on the After beautiful seeing Britain. that movie and reflecting on it, it's like there was a lot that was going on. So it was like a perfect storm. One, they one the dude had survivor guilt while the widow, she was really grieving hard at the time. And they had a trauma bond connection that brought them together. And then because basically the question is, do you believe in trauma bonds? And is that a is that a real is that a real thing to like like is that real love or just because they were like in that trauma bond that's the reason why they're together like it can be a lot of different ways that you can digest that but also she had small kids she had a lot going on with her that the absence of that male figure was very prevalent it was very like he was a big part of their lives he was a provider he helped them establish the life that they did have and things like that they also have three small children together and him not being there was definitely a big blow to the family dynamic that they had so the best friend actually stepping in kind of helped facilitate like basically their family can continue to roll on as normal because that place was never vacant it was a it was only vacant and that that spot got refilled very quickly so in that sense it worked out where i think it gets kind of problematic is that those kids are the the guy that died but because they were so young the only father figure they know is the new guy so they call him dad which that blew my mind i'm like that's not your dad my dude that's definitely not your dad that's not your dad but that is his dad because that's the only father figure i ever knew the other guy wasn't there because he was always climbing and then he died prematurely so i can see how it happened and i can understand 
And I just think it was a lot of different circumstances that came that court like that came together at the same time to make it be like that. But it's still a very crazy story for sure. So I mean, would you be cool with your homie getting with your lady after your dad? Also, I'm I'm dead. Do what you, yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. You're with not that. gonna come back from the dead and and you know shake no. and rattle chains. I mean, they <laughs> also because if you at the towards the end of the movie, they they gave him his respect. They didn't like yes. spit on his grave. Like yes, they, they once did. they found out they could find his body because he was he was lost to the mountain, and then yeah. they end up finding his body. And they had a whole base. They basically had a whole goodbye ritual for him, like as his last like as a last peace offering type of thing. And I and I think that's. I think that's where it is. They at least respected, like they at least respected him enough to at least give him a final goodbye. And the the way the friend made it seem, he said that I'm doing all of this. Like yes, it it also is, it also is a little bit selfish that he, basically because that guy always wanted that type of dynamic in his life. He wanted the family life. He didn't like he was single. That dude like basically he saw his friend's life and he always wanted all of that. And then when he died, he kind of embraced all of that which is like more for him but also it also helped everybody else out so it's kind of like one hand washes the other type of thing so i think it, it a, a tragic situation and a little bit of selfishness end up helping everybody else out so i mean the the day, it helps everybody it was kind of sus though like how he just moved in on jenny and the kids but i mean for mm -hmm. me i wouldn't care because i'm not here you have my blessing to go and be happy, even in life. Like say I lost function of my penis or I no longer had sexual desire. Go find someone that you can be fulfilled with on some Hulk Hogan and Bubba type time. But but Torn is a tearjerker. And, and Joey, I know the cancer crab and you had you boiling like a baby. No, nah, I just thought it was, at first when, when they were talking about it, because I thought, because they do look similar also. I thought yes. that he, yes. I thought he was the dad at first. Yeah. He was like. The it, kids more, look more like him than they did their father. Yes. That's why I was yeah. like, I was like, it's, I didn't think he died until they said, well, when did you and mom really start to get together? And I'm saying, what? That's not the husband? Like, no, that's the best friend. Like. Oh, now, now I got set back. Now I got I was like, okay, now, now we're cooking bacon. Now we're cooking. I sure. mean, me personally, I'm not exploring like that. I'm good. The most I'm doing is prospect pork on a Saturday night, and I damn near died doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the lesson is to not ignore your instinct. Like Alex ignored his instinct. To he said he didn't want to go that time too. Right. And then him and David and Conrad ignored their instincts. They went out, uh, you know, instead of staying at camp. But you mm -hmm. know, Torn reminded me, Joey, of this other movie I saw as a kid called Alive. It was about the rugby team and their plane crashed in the Andes. They ran out of food and they had to eat their friend who mm. died to survive. And mm -hmm. there used to be a commercial for Andes mints and they were mimicking that shit. Like it was horrible. Like they were <laughs> food and the guy starts popping Andes and then, um, it, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. But then um, 127 hours, um, that was another movie it reminded me of with James Franco. We had to cut his arm off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Cause he was in the ice. The ice. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, listen, sometimes you just got to cut things to free yourself or save your show. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess I needed to go with my instincts as well. You know, you know, but mm -hmm. thanks for the recommendation, Joey. And guys check out Torn. It's on Hulu. You know what else um, is a tearjerker though? The whale. Did you guys see the whale with uh, Brendan uh, Fraser? Brendan Fraser? No, yeah. I heard that no. man. I mean, aside from it being shot so well, and, and Brendan Fraser definitely deserved that Oscar, there was this binge eating scene. And I don't want to give away too much, but oh my God, like that shit was so accurate. Like for anyone who struggled with their weight, like you know exactly what that shit was about. But you know, I got to say this because this has just been on my mind since you told me about this movie. Torn reminded me of Brokeback Mountain in a way. And this is, I'm just going to say this. This is what I learned at my big age about sex. It's not about the actors, it's about the act. Like when you're in a space with someone, like a long isolated trip or prison, you're human. And eventually you act on urges. It doesn't make you sus. I mean, people always talk about a mind fuck and that's just what sex is. It's a mental, physical connection. But anyway, um, we've got this new segment here on the show. It's called It's Giving. 
And I know that's a phrase that everyone uses now, but it originated, like most things, in the Black LGBTQ community. And, you know, we like to be inform informative and insightful here. So I'm going to show you guys these pictures. They're these two guys from Atlanta, um, Brian Sanchez and, and Denzel Seegers, who got leg lengthening surgery. Okay, so this is the one guy. This is Brian. So you can see he was six foot. Now he's six six. Mm -hmm. And now this is Denzel. Denzel was five five, and now he's six foot. So the surgeries are done in Turkey. They cost anywhere from eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. Now social media went in on these dudes, talking about they got knee BLs and calling them mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So. Brian said that despite being taller than average, he thought his legs made him look like the character Thum Thum from uh, Spy Kids. And he wanted to be significantly <clears throat> taller than his wife so that they wouldn't be at eye level. And Denzel said he was tired of women rejecting him for his height. Joey, what's it giving? It's giving that... It's giving that they... they, they everybody has a self... It's giving self-esteem issues. That's what it's giving. It's giving self-esteem issues because I I I know this Haitian dude that's four eleven. He's small dude, but he has a beautiful family. It he he could use the he could use the weight of the world of him being short. Like oh no, but no, he like I'm just short, but I still do everything like a regular person. It's almost like a midget. Do we feel bad for midgets being midgets? No, midgets are people too. And yes, they might have different obstacles to go through but at the end of the day they still have they have to they have to live through that experience so how they navigate through that is how they navigate so if they have to get a stepping stool or whatever to help them get to navigate through that life then that's perfectly fine it's pretty much the same thing these guys felt that their height is too small the, there's a there's something that they can do about it. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. But if there's something that they can do about it and they have the means to do it, then there's nothing wrong with that. And body modification, it's only cool when it's piercings and tattoos. But now if I cut my tongue in half or if I start looking like the tiger or lizard man and now I'm going crazy. Or now if I if a girl gets a BBL, that's cool. But if I get if I get cool scoped in because I want my six pack to pop out, now I'm a weirdo like the body modification only works as if it's an accepted part of the modification field. You know what I mean? And that's where it's like, that's where I feel like it's problematic. But I'm also very, I'm not the tallest guy. I'm only five, six, five, seven. That's, that's a little bit below average, but I think I'm funnier than the average person. So my funniness and my coolness make up for me for my lack of shortness. So when I was back in the dating game, I used to tell people I'm shorter than what I was. So I used to like, I used to, that would be like my little gimmick. Like, yeah, I'm like, I'm four, I'm five foot nothing. Like, oh, I don't like guys that are five foot nothing. Well, then you're not going to like me then. And then the people that would give me a chance, you're not five foot nothing. Why would you tell me that? Because it will show you if you would care or not. Obviously you don't care. And obviously we're here and I'm not five nothing. And now all of that pre- all of that preamble type of mentality is going to be gone because you don't, because I'm not that. You know what I mean? Kai, what's it giving? Mental health. Mental health is real. <laughs> like, honestly, I think with my medications, what is it about me that physically, if it's causing, if it's, you know, non needed cosmetic surgery, what is it that I can't get over, right? Because I can get the knee surgery, but am I still attacking? I still can't get women, right? So what is it now? I'm tall enough, but I still can't get women. Or, you know, people are like, oh, I got the surgery, but now I regret it, right? I get all the people that have, like, the bot surgeries, right? You're, you're doing it, but you're not doing it safely. There's a reason I need to get in society, my partner. Someone's telling me that, hey, let's talk through the issues. Why do I feel this way? Maybe help me feel better about how I see myself in the mirror. If not, let's go straight to the surgery table, and then we get results, and now you're like, you know, you look at the show botched. The first one, okay, cool. The second one, no. Why are you in your first sword, your surgery? And now you're just getting stuff fixed, fixed, fixed. And now you're adding to the issue you had already because now what you want to fix is now uglier. Uh, it's honestly just mental health. Yeah, it's, it manifests itself in so many different ways. You know, we either have major problems, little problems. But like, hey, I'm a short man. How do I feel? How do I feel more confident in my life if I am short? 
maybe my therapist can help me through that. But honestly, doing all these different things, you know, my wife to be taller. Who who said you look like thumbs? Like that's you coming out of left field. That's still. I, and here. he's clearly like, like into his look because he's a bodybuilder. This guy, like he, I didn't see anything wrong with him. But okay, so this is what it's giving for me. It's giving South Park. I'm a dolphin. Do you guys remember that episode? No, I never seen that. Oh one. my lord! So the dad <laughs> gets like this this surgery to become a dolphin. Like one of the other, the, the Mr. Garrison, I think he he got his legs lengthened or some. Anyway, jokes aside, I'm not even going to go in on these two. They're good looking dudes, but everyone has something they're insecure about. And the message in the music is to be kind. Like some chick told Denzel. She didn't like him because he was short. He internalized that shit for years. So, I mean, we got guys out here telling girls their pussies are ugly. I mean, only toxic people weaponize things that people can't change. But like I said earlier, technological advancements are going in the wrong direction. Like, can we regenerate limbs already? Like, what about organs or, or hearing or sight? You know? But there should be nothing wrong with if a girl could get a BBL. Then I can get, I can get, you can get I can a BBL. Get a six pack. I can get, a, or I can get a BBL or whatever. That's I, can, I should be able to get my fake six pack if a girl can get a BBL. I agree. I mean, listen. Anyway, these guys are brave, brave as hell. Like I've done elective procedures myself, and that's a big risk in general. Being put under and then having to recover, and then you run the risk of infection and clots and all of that. Then to be roasted by social media, I mean, that's another thing in and of itself. But what we, while we do need to normalize men getting work, I don't know, my mind just always goes back to the active shooter. Like, I just imagine one of those guys is at the mall, you know, shopping or trying to get some exercise. And if they had to run and they're not fully healed, their legs would break and they'd be trampled. I mean, I can't help that my mind works like this, but you know, like this, we live in America. But now, as far as me, like as far as my height, like I always wanted to be 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, so... I bought these stupid like sneaker boots from ASOS, thinking they would give me like the two or three inches I wanted <laughs> for ASOS Live. <laughs> and I only got an inch, but I mean, they're comfortable, so I wear them like everywhere. But, but, and by the way, I put the pics back up of the guys who had the uh, surgeries, and you can see that their arms are still proportioned to their original heights. And also, I see like some edema in the pics. But anyway, unless you were born with a defect, everything on your body is proportionate. Like your forearm length is the length of is your shoe size. Um, here I go with the, the science lessons. You listen, you know I keep coming with deeper and more shit. I can't right, help it. Like, <laughs> I can't right, help right. it. <laughs> but no, seriously. Look, look, look. And then and then if you do this, if you go from your elbow to your fingertips, that is one quarter of your height. So if you go from your elbow to your to like the longest finger that you have, that's one quarter of your height. Like if you take your thumb, if you do this, look at what I'm doing right now. If you do this, this is the length of your nose bridge. So someone who had a nose job, they can't do this. But if you go like this. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. See? And then your nose is halfway between your hairline and your chin. And the space between your eyes right here, that's one eye. And then the space between your eye and your ear, let me go this way. Eye and your ear, that's one ear. And that's like just on your face. Because now your chest is like halfway between your genitals and the top of your head. And it's as wide as a quarter of your height. And so like, think of it this way. If a standard door, right, is 80 inches, or that's six foot six, then a six foot person's head is going to come to like the top of the inner square. And I hope you app daters are paying attention for the, when the folks lie about how tall they are. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I haven't even gotten to like scapular positioning and, and shoulder to crotch lamp, crotch to heel. Like, listen, I'll be dropping signs like, like how many like, did you put this on PowerPoint in. slide for me? Like, just <laughs> y'all, I'm telling you, like somebody, listen, somebody's got to drop facts on these platforms. I mean, listen, SAG after is off strike for Hollywood still using AI. ASOS is out here lying. Radio Cats is catching Rico charges. DC niggas is trying to carjack Secret Service. Horses is getting loose on the plains. ShopRite got their seafood department up escorting customers with crab legs up to the registers. Nah. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. But I mean, listen, at least they got turkey legs. Yeah, let's go. Well, wait, did you get it? At least they got turkey legs. They went to Turkey <laughs> to get the legs. Okay.
Well, by the way, shout out to uh, the guy Denzel. He's a Navy vet. Yo, man, I got to take a nap after this. Like, I was up early this morning, Black Friday shopping. Yo, they jumped the cashier this morning. So listen, this is how it went down. This is how it went down. I'm like three spots back in the line with my cart. And these five girls just roll up and they on the cashier and they just start punching it in the head. So at first I'm thinking it's like, you know, like a neighborhood beef or some shit. You know, because this is this happened at Club Walmart. And Joey, you know, this is the Walmart everybody and their mom goes to. You in Philly, you know which one I'm talking about. So I'm in line. And these sisters is just molly whopping her. And before you all get started, wow, why didn't you break them up? Like, I don't know. Nah, nah, nah. You don't break people. I don't jump in. Be crazy. Crazy. But, but I did call 911. I did call 911. So they're just rolling on her. And she's not even really like fighting back. Like she just had her hands up, like trying to protect her face. And so the girls got like a bunch of windmills in and, and you know, then they bounced. But wait, but wait, why, do, why did one of the girls when she was running out, she just grabbed like a handful of plastic bags. Like she damn, she damn near broke the bag holder, like trying to steal the bags. And I guess her instinct was like, let me steal something before I get out of here because I ain't never coming back. I'm yes, so we're all just in shock. So the lady in front of me, she had like this little flip phone out trying to record and I'm like, you're not getting no 4K. On nah, 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 nah. <laughs> so then this other lady, she comes up and I think she was like a manager or something. And she like waddled over and gave her like a bottle of water. And I'm like, that's not going to help us. She got just got an ass beat. Like, that's not going to do shit. <laughs> so, so listen, so this is the crazy shit. How about 911 had me on hold? And when the dispatcher finally picked up, she's like, oh, we got that call already. And then she banged on me. Mm -hmm. Like, just real fucking nasty and surly. And I really hope the city council really does do something about that. But anyway, so I'm in line. And I see my fat brother. I'm like, oh, shit, fine. I didn't know you worked here. He come over like, Chris, what you doing down here? And so I'm telling him what happened. And he works there in loss prevention. And so he said that earlier, one of the girls um, who came there she to, to fight the girl, she was in line checking out. And she felt like the cashier had an attitude with her. So they exchange words or whatever. And then, you know, the girl said, oh, I'm coming back with my friends and, or my cousins or whatever. And she cashier said, do it. I and she just went on about a day. <laughs> so he said the manager did ask her, did she want to finish her shift, you know, at another store? And she said, I ain't on no punk shit. And so she stayed. And I mean, at least they offered because some stores would have just let their staff get washed. And I mean, mm -hmm. I just, I always say those who leave are those who went. But anyway, um, I was like, you know, the girl stole some bags and he going to say, nah, they stole her. And I'm like, <laughs> shout out to my frat brother. I'm not going to put your name out there, but you a nut five. It's crazy because I usually don't like going out when I know it's going to be crowded. Like, especially with, like I said, with these mass shootings and everything, like I'm on high alert. But the moral of the story is stop thinking it's punk ass to get out of Dodge. Protect yourselves. Those who leave are those who win. And yo, he said they would have escorted her to the other store if she wanted to go. And also, I'm going to lean in on this one. If you're a black cashier, speak to other black people when we get in your line. Don't just be pleasant with the white folks. Be pleasant with us, too. Like, don't get Keith Lee at work, even though that's probably not the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> like, the worst thing is getting jumped at your job by six crack baby hood rats who ain't got nothing to lose. But I didn't even buy anything, honestly that I couldn't have waited until Cyber Monday for. I'm like, man, I got to get home. I got to get out of here. I got to do the show. But the other thing is, too, I could have gone to self-checkout. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but they have these scanners now. They look like phones. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing on those phones is they're watching everything you buy and, and scan and they check your total. And like, let's say somebody shoplifts, all of those phones jam up. And then they got to go to everyone's station. And it's just a whole fiasco. And I'd rather just honestly just have somebody else bag up my stuff and scan it so i can get out of there and one one more thing fyi black friday is not tied to slavery stop believing everything you read on facebook and the, and the ig gossip sites like you got to do your research like seriously but i saw this meme on black friday and it said um dear black friday we all have flat screens put those groceries on sale <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure like facts i mean bro Milk is seven dollars. Like I'm straight about to just be vegan. Are you gonna break the oxtail? Yo, all right, Joey. This is for you. There's a spot in Philly. 
that my homegirl told me about. They sell an oxtail cheesesteak. Mm. The shit is $35, though. No. No. And here's but the other it's because thing. the oxtail being the $35, I can see why it's $35. And but my... here's the deal. It's not full of oxtail. It's a cheesesteak that they put a little bit of oxtail on top of. Okay. It's not like you get full oxtail on the cheesesteak. Mm-hmm. $35. Yeah, I'm good. Um, shout out to my homegirl who told me about that. Um, let me know how that steak was because I, I you, you, you want that's all that's all you know. But anyway, before we go, before we go, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge that 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Now, the Chris Davis show was on break during the summer while all the festivities were underway. But I wanted to ask you guys. What are some of your favorite hip hop records? My brother raised me on Nas. Like, that was his favorite guy. Like, we were anti Jay Z and stuff like that. Of course, we respect Jay Z work and stuff like that. But he, I, I, I grew up on a lot of like New York hip hop and things like that. And um, what's funny about that is that like some of the stuff that like comes to my mind isn't like some of the most mainstream stuff. Like, I like some old 50 Cent. 50 Cent, that, that, some of that stuff still rocks. You know what I mean? So, I like, um, like, you're just talking about, like, some, like, older stuff, like, it, like, Nas has, like, newer stuff, he has, like, Magic 1, 2, and 3, those albums are all fire, he had The King's Disease 1, 2, and 3, like, he's been putting out good quality music, and also, and these are, like, more recently, these aren't, like, super old, these aren't, like, the, this is not, like, Stillmatic, Illmatic, um, hip hop is dead, like old stuff. This is like more like recent stuff. So that's always good. I bang with Drake. That him and sexy red, that hands on your knees shit. That shit, that shit good. That, that's a club yeah. banger. You know what I mean? Hands on your knees. Tell you, that's what... I went to a sexy red concert. That was just so much energy and live. But I think it's not, not their records. It's like things about the culture of hip hop. I miss Dot Pit, the mixtape culture. Drought coming out, Wayne, Dipset, like these iconic like moments mm-hmm. or factions where you can go back and be like, man, remember when Joel, Joel was supposed to save the game? Joel Santana was supposed to be that guy. It didn't happen, but still, those moments where you're just hyped for, you know, clockwork that when Jeezy first got on the scene, you know, mm-hmm. really seeing when Gucci got lost away, Waka, all these iconic moments where, you know, again, the, our old school now. You put, oh, let's do it on, we all go ham on it, you know? I just those like kind of moments where they were new and felt fresh. And now looking back, it's nostalgia, a lot of that stuff, you know? And, you know, and so that's what I miss where how the what when I grew up in hip hop, what it was, what it is. I wanna see someone body someone else's beat. You know, I don't wanna see all these little EP, the drills, the remixes of the remix of the remix, all this other stuff. I wanna see someone go bar for bar, pop thirty two on something real quick. You know, we had your favorite rappers, four people on a beat. Who's going to end it, you know? But, um, you know, honestly, I think, but that's what hip-hop is. It's meant to evolve from where you had the scratch and the DJ in my first game to what it is. And maybe that's me being my old headness where if I don't get it, I just don't like it necessarily. And so I'm learning how do I adapt because Jay ain't getting no younger, Fab ain't getting younger, you know, Wheezy, he had, what, two or three dreads left? But it's one of those <laughs> yes. things where, you know, I have over time, but I think, you know, I will be seeing Lil Wayne when he's 60 on stage rapping. <laughs> like, I'm going to be there. I'm going to go do it. You know, Wheezy F, baby, the F is for phenomenal. I'm going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, um, you, guys you guys know I'm with the, the shits. Right, you both exactly. know I'm with the shits. It, but it's the culture, you know, I think in yeah. fact the it's not the music, it's what it represents, you know, the fashion, the way we talk, the way we interact, you know, yeah. future is still a menace out here. <laughs> yeah, it's man. all that and above, but that's, I think, what it represents more so, just a specific song. So, this is what just always blows my mind about hip-hop, is that what we know was born in a community room, and that's just very symbolic. Because how many times have we gone down to the community room or to a community center for a birthday party or a going away party or a baby shower or to some other get together? And I mean, you couldn't get in unless your name was on the list. So, but for me, 
I like anything that fuses hip hop with another genre, specifically like dancehall, R and B, house. Like I still go hard for my straight up hip hop records, but for me, it's the records like The Jam, P is Still Free, Dolly My Baby, Ghetto Red Hot, Take It Easy, Think, Romantic Core, Nothing But Love, and I mean, rest in peace to Heavy D. He was actually the first one to do the video with all the models. Some people think it's Q-Tip, but it was heavy. Shout out to Q-Tip too. But um, Funk That, uh, shout out to the illustrious Blacks. They remade Funk That. And I used to get in trouble for rapping that shit in class. Like I knew all the words and I would add words. And I'll share that sometimes, just not today. Um, but what else? Uh, Buffalo Stance, The Chubster, Rhythm is a Dancer, The Power, 3 a.m. Eternal which is like truly a, a, an early dubstep record. Like guys like Skrillex studied that record. Mm -hmm. um, I Can't Stand It, which is a legendary obscure banger. Love Bug Starsky, you gotta believe. And yo, when I was a kid, I had this toy called a Talk Boy. It was a tape recorder that uh, Kevin had in Home Alone. Remember that? Yep. Remember the, the tape recorder? Mm -hmm. So I'd be on it, right? With You Gotta Believe playing in the background. And it was like the playoffs. It was like the Mets playoffs or something. And everybody's running around talking about, yeah, you got to believe. And so I had a record on. And, I, and, I'm, in, and I'm in a talk, boy. I'm like, yeah, fuck the Mets. You got to believe in my big cock. And you hear my mom in the background going, Chris, watch out. And like, it, 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 that record that's, is wild. That record was in D minor. And my D was a minor back then. But anyway, <laughs> rest in peace to Love Bucks, Starsky. I got to see if I still have that too. I probably bring this record up every time we talk about music, but Crash Goes Love, Lolita Holloway was Planet Rock and Play at Your Own Risk. And those were freestyle records. I'll say it again, specifically to the Hispanics in Miami. Freestyle came from the same place and people as hip hop did. We can't forget the love Shaka showed to hip hop either. Shaka stayed having hip hop breakbeats. This is my night, which it takes uh, two samples. Kid and Play sample Ain't Nobody on Last Night. De La had Shaka on All Good. Big said what he said about Shaka on Dreams, and I'm not going to repeat it because the cuss bank is looking crazy already. Now, I don't need any more strikes. She's definitely in the hip-hop clubs back in the day, Latin quarters. We love Shaka here at the Chris David Show. But the R&B influence in hip-hop is a whole show in itself. Shout out to Mac Wilds and Nathaniel, Staten Island, BK, Stand Up. Anyhow, guys... Get those health screens, prostate and testicular, but also get those physicals. Get those A1Cs and lipids check. Get that blood pressure in check. If you're 50 today, happy birthday. You need to be scheduling that colonoscopy. If you have a mouth, schedule that dentist visit. If you have a head, schedule that eye exam. It's our job to look out for one another and hold each other accountable. Also, next Friday, December 1st is World AIDS Day. This is your official Chris David Show reminder to do your big one and go out and get tested. For more information, visit HIV.gov or contact your, your, your healthcare provider. If you don't have anything to be ashamed of and your people here to support you, like Damo Jones says, wrap it up. I need to make a retraction, though, from our episode of... Uh, the friend to the show, Chandra Smith, Ms. Wheelchair, America 2024. We mentioned that Chandra was the first um, Black Ms. Wheelchair America in the organization's 50-year history. That statement was not true. Dr. Gaynell Colburn of Baltimore, Maryland, became the first Black woman to win the title of Ms. Wheelchair America in 1984. Ten years prior to winning the title, Dr. Colburn became paraplegic after she was hit by a drunk driver in an auto accident at 16. Dr. Colburn, Ms. Wheelchair America 1985, has a PhD and an MD certification in health science and pediatric wellness. She is also an accomplished percussionist and vocalist, Essence Award winner, teacher, and motiva motivational speaker. On behalf of the Chris David Show, Dr. Gaynell Colburn, we celebrate you. And before we go, I usually end the show asking our guests, you know, the time machine question. But since it's the end of the year, I want to ask you guys the $20 question. What did you learn about yourself in 2023? You know, it's funny. You, always, you, you see the meme, but you're going like, God, I'm not your toughest soldier. I'm done fighting battles. But um, I'll say 
resilience, resiliency. You know, we all have our personal battles, things happen, but honestly, when a goal gets tough, you just keep going. And knowing that diversity, power through, but also just saying pace and grace. Grace was something I had to really learn this year to know that it's okay where I am. I'm, I'm going to get to where I need to be, but in time, enjoy the journey. Give myself the grace that, hey, it's not a two-week process. It might be months, but that's okay. And at the same time, I'll still get the same result. So I learned a couple of different things. One, like uh, from um, from like a work standpoint, you like everybody talks about job security and everything like that, but you don't really want a job that is only going to like if your job doesn't appreciate you or do anything like that, why do you care if you're secure at a job that doesn't appreciate you or care about you? You know what I mean? So I literally had like at the beginning of the year, I'm, I was at one job. They didn't appreciate me. I left. I was working at another job. They seen the value that I, that they lost and they end up offering me a bigger compensation and everything like that just to get me back. And that's when I really like looked at it and, like you're way more qualified and you're way more like than you think. Like I just thought that I'm just a regular guy, your average guy. I'm 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 just as replaceable as anybody else. But just because you're replaceable doesn't mean that you lag value. You know what I mean? Anybody can do a job, but not everybody is going to be able to do the job with the certain soft skills that I have. You know what I mean? I know how to talk to people. I know how to interact with people, connect with people. Those are soft skills that not everybody has. Somebody can be just as technical as I am, but not everybody will have that type of skills. Also, another thing is that I am a party animal. My thing is that I can't just take one shot and just be chill about it. I'm going to have to drink half the bottle with you so that I can I want to feel something. What I learned is that because I'm hot and cold, either you gonna you have to be if it's gonna be like that, then you have to follow it through. If I'm if I'm gonna be responsible and like be focused and things like that, then I can't have partying on my mind. Or vice versa. If I'm gonna party, then make sure that partying is like you're gonna just party and then know when to let the party stop. Because party has to end at some point, you have to get back to 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 reality and stuff like that it's all good to have a good time but too much of anything is always a bad thing so one thing i learned is that like yeah i like to drink i used to drink every day like now it's more of like um of a special occasion type of thing like you one you'll see how your body will feel better and like your weight and everything like that because people love to drink and I love to drink too. I'm not shaming nobody. Like if you want to drink every day, that's fine. I drank I drank two tall boys and a couple of shots a day for months, for months. Like, and was that the best thing? Probably not. Am I sharper now that I'm not drinking as much? Yes. I'm a lot more focused. I'm a lot sharper. Um, I'm a lot more like there mentally. So if you feel that you're going through something a little bit like mental, you don't know why you're in a funk, you don't know what is really going on with you, just take a break from the drink a little bit. Take a take a take a day or two. Maybe, maybe once you stop drinking a little bit, then you'll see maybe where you can maybe it's not the drinking. Maybe it might be like, oh, me drinking on top of me being sad is the reason why I'm really depressed right now. You know what I mean? But why are you sad? I'm sad because I have no friends right now. My relationship is not going the right way. My job life is really stressing me out. You know what I mean? Then you're adding drinking or drugs or anything else on top of that. And now you have a whole a whole mixture of different emotions why you don't know why you are where you're at. And then some people lose themselves. Like, I lost myself. Like, how did you lose yourself? Like, you are you are always the same person that you always been. So how did you like where how can't you find how can't you find your grounding point? How can't you go back there? And if that's hard for you, then you might need to start like start cutting back some stuff and seeing where some of those issues lie at. And then you'll be able to grow from that. And that's what I seen. I was able to I was able to put a little bit of the drinking down and the partying down. And then from there, I seen that I'm a lot more focused and I'm a lot more. I'm a lot more. I'm just a lot better in every aspect, you know. Congratulations on, you know, pulling it together and figuring that out because we all been there. We've all been there. 
with, with some things harder, you know, than others. So um, I'll keep mine brief. And y'all know I'm really not going to keep it brief, but I'm going to try. Okay, so when I first started this show at the top of the year, I thought things would go differently. I thought my friends would be more supportive of me pursuing my dream. And I thought that people that I've interacted with would be as willing to support me in this film, in this field of human endeavor as I had supported them in theirs. Instead, I was given excuses, I was ghosted, and people who know me pretended to not know me. I learned to really see it for me and everything I'm given. I learned that regardless of what anyone says or does, I am living in the light and the right in the way. And I know what's best for me, my family, my life, and my show. I learned to be kinder to myself and give myself grace because I'm doing my best. I learned not to compromise my comfort. I learned to let people be loud and wrong, even when they weren't interested in learning facts, but just being the loudest person in the room. I learned to not let squatters who don't belong dictate how I exist in my space. I learned that only I define my peace, my success, and my happiness. I learned to no longer let others move my goalposts. I learned to leave people alone who don't prioritize facts over foolishness. I learned to stop trying to prove myself to people who were committed to misunderstanding me. I learned that I choose family. I learned that setting boundaries isn't a punishment. I learned to leave old relationships in the past. Don't reach out, don't add, don't message. Just leave them in the past. And if it's meant to be, if it's meant for us to reconnect, we will. But don't go seeking them out. If anything, let them reach out and really reach out via text or call. Not some waving hand emoji or this stupid thing down here. The googly eye uh, emoji. I learned that there's always a brand new street to turn on with new people to get to know and build community. I learned I don't have to share spaces or walls with people who steal my joy. I learned not to coddle low-hanging fruit and not to take those seriously who don't take themselves seriously. I learned that people who always have to be right are usually always wrong. I learned that I'd rather be happy all the time than to be right all the time. I learned to embrace peace and joy and that I don't have to hide my happiness out of fear of someone taking it from me because I learned to finally take my own advice for once and not to invest in anyone who doesn't give me interest. I learned that I won. Might not be the fave, but I won. Lastly, I learned that black don't crack, but we gain weight. Okay. <laughs> and I learned that sativa is the ops. <laughs> oh, but, oh, but I learned more about me in 2023 than in any other year of my life. And I plan to learn even more in 2024. All for the good, all for the better. Kai and Joey, thanks for being here. We're going to do this again because this was a hit. All right? And everyone, clap it up for our guys. Joey Black, a.k.a. Joey the Heckler, and our official Chris David Show mixologist, Mr. Joey Bastin. And your favorite person's favorite person. Champagne Cola Poppy. Wait a minute. I have it all written down, but I, I got it all here. Champagne Cola Poppy. The Chunky Jaden Smith, Black Kina, Supreme Kai, LL Cool K, Mr. Kai Thomas. All right? I like the Supreme oh, Kai. <laughs> I, I like all it. of them, man. I was like, I got to see. I'm just, I, I was going to try to pick one, but I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to read the whole list. <laughs> I am your host, Chris David, the light skinned Malcolm Jamal Warner, the hood Lenny Kravitz. The Afro-futuristic magical Negro version of Joan Hamburg. We are a vibe. Thanks for listening. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I need to make an announcement. Wait a minute. I need to make an announcement. So here's the deal. I am so impressed with how you guys helped me with those questions earlier in the show that I'm pleased to announce that in 2024, the Chris David Show will be starting a new segment during our men's discussion panel called Ask the Guys. So send in your questions for that, info at thechrisdavidshow.com. Remember to put Ask the Guys in the subject line. 
and send in those sex coach questions as well. Thanks for listening and watching. Tell your friends, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your baby daddy, tell your boyfriend, tell your sister, tell your cat, tell your dog, tell your doctor, tell everyone who wants or has an EBL and a BBL or both to follow us on Instagram at Chris David TV and follow our show at the Chris David Show on Instagram and YouTube. You can also visit ChrisDavidShow.com. There you'll find everything you need to know about the show. Be safe and be smart out there in those Black Friday streets. I am Chris David. And this is The Chris David Show. Be kind and be well. And that's it, guys. Wait, I got to stop the recording. I'm going to stop this. <laughs>